Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm calling to order this meeting of the Planning and Development Council of the Town of Oakville. Council, do you have any declarations of pecuniary interest? Madam Clerk, there are none. Uh, would two of you like to move and second resolving in the Committee of the Whole? Councillor Hutchins, Councillor Lischina, all in favor? And that carries. We're now in Committee of the Whole, which is the relaxed form of rules for that we use for these kinds of uh, subjects, and that's going to be very helpful to us tonight because uh, these items kind of relate to each other in a very fundamental way. Um, so, Council, we have a uh, number one item is the Lakeshore Road East Final Streetscape Plan, and we have a presentation from Paul Allen. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to start off my presentation by doing a really quick recap of how we got here today for the um, final streetscape plan for the Lakeshore Road. The process started with the downtown transportation and streetscape study master plan that was completed and approved by council in 2015. One of the primary recommendations coming out of this master plan was the approved functional design for Lakeshore Road. This illustration shows um, one of the major changes to Lakeshore Road, which is the removal of the center turn lane to allow for a wider pedestrian and boulevard areas on each side of Lakeshore Road. The turning lanes will be maintained at the signalized intersections on Lakeshore, however. In July 2016, Council provided the following direction to staff to relaunch a public engagement process with traditional, classical, and contemporary furniture options for the streetlight poles, benches, bike rings, and bollards. Council approved moving forward with the granite pavers and curbs, and they selected the waste receptacles. Council also asked staff to develop options for Lakeshore Road that would provide in whole or in part a flexible or curbless street. In October 2016, Council approved the traditional theme for streetscape furnishings. In February 2017, Council made the final selection for the traditional style streetscape furnishings for the benches, bike rings and bollards, the acorn style standard pole to match the existing streetlight poles, graphite black for the furniture color, 3,000 Kelvin LED light color temperature for the street lights, and they selected the bridge railing for the bridge that was constructed in 2017 over 16 Mile Creek. The public engagement for the final streetscape plan included a public information center that was held in the evening on Thursday, December 7th, 2017. There were 32 attendees. We also held a session in the morning with the downtown BIA on that same day. 11 members of the downtown BA att attended that session. A summary of the comments that were received for both those sessions um, are contained in the staff report in Appendix D. Uh, generally, the, the comments received were um, suggestions for, this, for the project, but were, were generally um, in support of the overall project. This is a, uh, a graphical illust illustration that was shown at the PIC. We also um, included a 3D visualization at the PIC that attendees could um, virtually walk through the um, streetscape plan um, on along Lakeshore Road from all the way from Allen, Allen to Navy. Um, we really wanted to give the, the public a uh, sense of what the streetscape plan would look like in, in three-dimensional. And uh, I think our, our consultants did a fairly good job um, with their 3D renderings and the 3D visualization. We also included the 3D visualization on the web page, so people that couldn't attend the meeting uh, had a chance to look at the overall plan. We also presented a more traditional view of the streetscape plan at the PIC. Streetscape plans were developed for each block that showed the locations of the street, streetlight poles, the streetscape furniture, um, the uh, granite curb and, and pavers, uh, street street um, markings. Um, this is a streetscape plan um, from Navy Street to Thomas Street. 
You'll notice that at the signalized intersection with Navy Street, we are maintaining the, uh, the, the turn lanes. The next street stake plan is from Thomas Street to George Street. Of notice here is the addition of a proposed pedestrian crossover or PXO at the intersection with Thomas Street. Moving towards George Street, you'll see the start of the flexible or curbless street. The, uh, the gray um, on the street represents the unit pavers that will be used instead of traditional asphalt. Um, this area also does not have a raised curb, so you can notice the bollards that are acting as a physical barrier between the roadway and the uh, boulevard areas. This is the streetscape plan from George Street to Dunn Street. The Kerbal Street continues through the George Street intersection and ties in with um, Town Square. The next streetscape plan from Dunn to Trafalgar, again, a, a pedestrian crossover is proposed at the intersection with Dunn Street. And working our way across the Trafalgar Road, again, you'll notice that the, the existing turn lane configuration is maintained. Um, working our way um, through the project from Trafalgar to Reynolds, um, I should mention you'll see the, the um, green sharrows in the roadway. Um, that's uh, demarcating that Lakeshore Road is to be a shared roadway with cyclists. And then the final block from Reynolds to Allen Street, the, um, another pedestrian crossover is proposed at Reynolds Street. So basically at all three of the non signalized intersections we are proposing pedestrian crossovers. Um, this is part of the um, overall plan to make Lakeshore Road a more pedestrian friendly destination um, um, for people to come to Lakeshore Road. This is an illustration of the um, curbless or flexible street looking toward George Street and Town Square. You'll notice that there is no raised curb the, um, the grade is basically the same across the boulevard area onto the street. You'll see the use of the black bollards to um, provide a barrier between the roadway and the boulevard areas. Council asked staff to look at a number of options for flexible streets. Uh, three options were developed. The, uh, the first option uh, closely resembles the recommendation from the downtown transportation study. Um, the flexible um, street basically goes on each side of George Street and tying into Town Square. The second option um, has a flexible street from Thomas to Dunn Street, so basically two full blocks of flexible street. And the final option is from Navy to Allen, so basically the entire six block project would be um, converted um, into a flexible street. Staff are recommending option one. This option most closely resembles what was recommended in the downtown transportation study, um, which had a goal of developing a focal point in the downtown tying Lakeshore Road, George Street, and Town Square, uh, which is the focus of many um, festivals and events in the downtown. Also, option two and three, with the increased um, use of um, unit pavers for the roadway, uh, the con con construction and maintenance costs would be um, significantly higher um, with, those, with those options. Options two and three would also require the use of additional bollards to separate the sidewalk and pedestrian area from the roadway. Um, this would um, have additional costs and some may consider this not to be quite as visually as appealing um, as the um, um, option one. There are also some operational and safety concerns about increasing the length of flexible streets on Lakeshore Road. Staff completed an assessment of the decorative streetlight poles um, to determine whether or not we should salvage and refurbish the existing poles or uh, replace them with new poles. Based on the, the cost of sandblasting or finishing, which is fairly high, and the fact that the existing poles are near the end of their lifespan, we are recommending that the poles be replaced with new poles. One of the big advantages of the new poles is that they come with um, standard attachments for things such as banners and hanging baskets.
With the re reconstruction of Lakeshore Road, there will be uh, a negative impact on the existing street trees. Um, with the widening of the, the boulevard area, the majority of the trees will need to be removed and replaced. There are a number of trees, um, you can see them shown in the diagram at the bottom in green. Um, I believe there are six trees that uh, are of fairly um, healthy um, condition. We are looking um, through the detailed design if there is a way that we can salvage um, some or all of these trees. For the trees that uh, majority that are being replaced, they will all be planted in soil cells. Um, you may have noticed the, the similar, the pictures are showing the installation with the Lakeshore Road Bridge. These soil cells will provide a much healthier um, growing area for the street trees. And in the long term, the street trees on, on Lakeshore Road will be much healthier than the ones that uh, are existing today. Um, I should also mention that the soil cells will be irrigated from runoff from the sidewalk area through a trench drain. So that will also provide um, benefits to the uh, tree growth over time. Uh, the town um, forestry department have been consulted on, on the plan and they are very supportive of the use of the soil cells. Um, they will also be directly involved in the selection of the tree species that will be planted on Lakeshore Road. The downtown transportation study contemplated an element in the streetscape design that would speak to local identity and sense of place. Um, to create a unique and interesting layer to the streetscape design, we are proposing to use bronze inlays to tell the stories of native oak trees in Ontario. Each block would be themed around a different species of oak tree. Inlays um, would include things such as the shape of the leaves, acorns, tree form diagrams, and species names. This project will also include smart city initiatives. We are currently evaluating a number of options, including pedestrian traffic counting devices, parking sensors and electronic parking information, Wi-Fi and USB charging stations, electronic vehicle charging stations, interactive inter electronic information boards, and hydro smart grid technologies. We also um, have successfully completed um, a pilot project for Big Belly Bin garbage receptacles. These garbage receptacles are solar powered um, compacting units that uh, send a Wi-Fi signal to our operations staff to tell them when they're ready to be emptied. Um, we are planning to have one big belly bin on each block in high volume areas on Lakeshore Road. One of our primary objectives with the Smart City Initiative is to make sure that we include all the underground infrastructure that will meet the needs of Smart City Initiative today and in the future. Uh, the last thing we want to do is have to go back up and, and dig up Lakeshore Road for um, future um, initiatives or smart city um, act implementation. Next steps, we will be completing the detail of all underground utilities and finalizing construction staging requirements. Um, we will be confirming and designing the smart city initiatives. This spring we'll be hosting a uh, public information center to present the timing and details on the 2018 two-way conversion of one-way streets in downtown Oakville and the resurfacing initiatives that are associated with that work. The preparation of the construction tender documents will be completed. Um, the two-way street conversion are planned to be completed in the fall of 2018. And near the end of, of this year, we will initiate a contractor pre-qualification process and issue the construction tender um, with a plan to award the contract either late 2018 or early 2019 with construction plan for 2019 and 2020. And that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm gonna start over here. Who's first? Or we'll, go to, we'll go to the very end and come over. Councillor O'Meara. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you very much um, to all the staff for the work. I know this has been a long time coming. Um, I have a few questions, and I guess the first one might be the easiest one, is what sort of infrastructure do we need to put under the ground for a smart city? So. Um, certainly, um, the main is in, under con conduits. And a lot of this, especially with the electronic vehicle charging stations, we need to make sure that we have the proper um, electrical feeds to go to those tr future charging stations. Um, basically making sure we have the conduits and we're also working closely with Oakville Hydro to make sure that the 
power feeds and source power supplies are um, there that can support all this infrastructure. Okay, and I, and I ask that because it's, it reminds me of what happened in, and you know, it's going off on a little bit of a, a, a different side, but, you know, it, we all got wired here in the past 40 years with Bell and stuff, and then it inhibited us from when the, the, the transfers to wireless technology came, and, and I'm wondering if things aren't going to go wirelessly, if we're prepared for that solar power charging stations, wireless technology and communications. I, I would hate for us to still go with you know, a wired technology because that's what's here today, knowing that whether it's going to be 5G tomorrow, that, you know, we're, we're sort of riding two horses at once. Are, are we, we going with the idea that we're going to understand at some point there's going to be capacity through a 5G network that's going to, you know, supplant a lot of the hard wire stuff that we're doing today? We are working closely with um, um, our consultant team who have brought in some experts on smart city initiatives and working closely with Oakville Hydro um, yeah, that is our goal is to try, to try to foresee as much as possible to make sure that these things are in the ground um, and capable for future things we might not even know we're going to use yet. So that is kind of the challenge is trying to, trying to look to the future and making sure that uh, we plan for that. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll leave that there. Um, I appreciate it. Um, I have a question about the Flex Street going at um, right in the middle. Why are we only going halfway up George Street? Why would we not go all the way up to Church Street with that Flex Street? Um, the, the initial pl uh, option, option one that we're recommending, it was um, developed as a focal point for kind of festivals around the, um, kind of starting from Town Square, working way up to George Street. So kind of going half a block was um, kind of identified as a critical mass for, the, for those festivals. So it's more just for the larger festivals? That's the, the reason for the Flex Street then? That is one of the primary uses, is to use it for um, be able to close the road down and um, make it more of a, a pedestrian um, gathering place for those types of events. Okay. Um, I, I might want to have that conversation later. I think if, you know, the farmer's market every Saturday going up George Street, it just makes sense to, to, to finish that up to Church Street, but I'll park that for a minute. Um, the bollards, are they permanent or are they the kind that you unbolt and they can come out? There would be a combination. Um, the ballers that would um, be beside Town Square would be designed so they can be removed okay. uh, for festival purposes and events that you might not want that row of ballers impeding the public area. And, and the ones that are permanent, um, did we look at perhaps uh, flower or garden structures as opposed to just black ballards or were we always intending to go with a black ballard? The, um, the option one was primarily bollards. Um, the other options, what we're extending, potentially extending, we would be using some of the planter for the trees as, as barriers, mm -hmm. per se. Um, but so in, the, in, the, in the option one, it's primarily using the bollards to, because uh, uh, we're, we're more of an open space in that, those areas around the intersection of George and Lakeshore. Okay. Uh, and then last question, um, this, the local identity and scene. I'm just curious how we came up with Ontario trees as the theme. Were there options presented to us about what we consider our local identity or, or did we, how did we end up with, with Ontario trees? I think the theme was the oak, the oak trees with Oakville. Um, that was an option that our um, consultant came up with and um, certainly any input or guidance from counselor that, that, that would be appreciated. No, I was just wondering if there was a process and we were floating around ideas and landed on that one or if that was just presented and we said, sure, we'll go with that one. Or I just don't know how these things sort of come about uh, or what the process is with that, so. Good evening, uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I believe we floated around uh, other options at the public engagement sessions. I think there were examples where we showed photos of little, um, bronze statues of uh, animals, et cetera. And I think this is the one we landed on because it was simple, uh, straight to the point. It seemed to fit in with Oakville's name, with oak trees. Okay, fair enough. Um, and sorry, I, I forgot one last question was just about the bike locks. Um, did we look at any sort of artistic uh, element to them other than just the straight pole in a circle? Or um, do we know what, what it would cost to maybe put a little bit of art or flair to the bike poles themselves other than just the standard ones that you can see in any municipality around here? We did look at a number of different, more standard options for the bike rack. We didn't really look at the artistic. Um, I know there are artistic type mm -hmm. bike racks that have been um, 
um, installed around different municipalities. But no, we'd, it was more that we did more look at the standard comparisons. Uh, well, I, I'm, I don't know how we uh, we might go about this, Your Worship, but I would be interested in seeing at least exploring from a comparative whether an acorn shape would be neat or whether there's some other element we can give a little flair to the standard bike lock. I um, if I if I could, um, uh, the the selection of the bike wings was part of the whole uh, engagement process with regards to the. Um, you recall originally we went with a contemporary theme. Uh, that didn't go over very well. Uh, the the it, words you're looking are for, I think, are street furniture consultation. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, street furniture consultation. What did I say? <laughs> uh, anyways, um, uh, we the, the the bike rack or the bike ring that was selected met was in the uh, traditional category theme. So when the palette was selected, the theme was selected traditional. We had uh, options for traditional bike rings, and this is the one that was selected and approved by council. Okay, fair enough. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm going to come across, uh, who, who wants to be next? Uh, Councillor Chisholm. Thank you, Your Worship. A couple of comments with respect to the, uh, the streetscape and, and how we integrate uh, the existing uh, facility of our downtown clock. Um, just for some background information, you're probably aware of it, but I just want to make it known that that's, that clock was a, a fundraiser that was done by the residents of Oakville uh, and with the town uh, being uh, putting it in. And uh, with respect to that, there is a programmable, I don't know if it's a computer, but there is a program, programmable unit across the street, and hopefully that will be integrated. And what that is is it has speakers on, on some of the, on the light standards uh, for Christmas music throughout the, uh, the Christmas time. So I'm hoping that will be included as part of your development, and that's the, the clock. The other thing <clears throat> with respect to the clock, the bottom part um, of the sponsorships that were put on, uh, I know there has been some, uh, it's been degrading, and consideration for to look at replacing that in uh, some shape or form when we're doing the streetscape uh, with respect to that. It's really the, uh, the speaker system and uh, for hopefully that'll be integrated with the new plan. The last part, um, I'm getting off the main street now. I'm on to um, uh, walk, uh, excuse me, Water Street. It said, in addition, Water Street has reached the end of its service life and staff plan to uh, reprocess this roadway in place and pave new uh, wearing layers of asphalt during the spring season. When we're talking the Water Street, is that from the top of Navy, it goes underneath the bridge and stops at, uh, at Robinson, or does it continue right through and up to Navy? The limits would be from under underneath the 60-mile bridge up the hill to Navy Street. So Navy underneath the bridge? But just down uh, from Navy, to down um, from the north side of Navy. So down the hill. Down the hill. Not past the library. And just, underneath the bridge. Just to the bridge. Oh, just to the bridge. Yes, it doesn't continue up and continue up and finish off in the rest of Water Street. No, no. Okay, thank you. Um, next, Councillor Giddings. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, further to Councillor O'Meara's question, with the changing technology, I believe we originally looked at having six charging stations for electric vehicles uh, on Lakeshore. We were looking at four charging stations. Uh, as Councillor Romero was saying, we're going to be seeing more and more. Will we have the ability to pull wire uh, without having to dig and add additional units in the future? Yeah, part, part of our design process, we are looking to design to um, um, include future charging stations on Lakeshore Road. Um, we anticipate that someday you may need to have a charging station on every corner, for, you know, if, if uh, the trends continue with electric vehicles. So we are planning to, for the ones we are going to construct with this project and for future ones that will come later on. All right. Um, the P&D machines, will we be keeping the ones that are in place or are we at a point where there's been a version 2.0 come out that deals with uh, the visibility issues and the sunlight and the height. And just curious where we are with that and whether we need more of them to prevent the walk to the, uh, to the machine. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as part of this project, our, uh, our parking enterprise, uh, people will be reviewing the uh, 
existing parking machines, the pay and display machines. Um, they are looking to move towards um, pay by plate uh, on the street. Uh, so the, ma the machines will have to be upgraded, whether or not they're, um, the, the, the in insides of the machine are upgraded and they stick with the existing machine or they may actually have to replace the entire machine because believe it or not, they've actually been there for a while. Um, and uh, you know, by the time this project is done, uh, these units will have been there for quite some time. So they may have to be repurposed. It's not a decision that's been finalized yet, but certainly being looked at. Uh, there may be a call for uh, uh, a request for proposals for different machines downtown, but I, I can't give you any more information than that at this time. No, that's fair, Director. Um, so we have a very detailed plan, but there's still some moving pieces that over between now and construction start, we're going to be specking and updating. Uh, we have, I agree with the light standards to go with new. Is there a possibility to have outlets, don't mean to get into the weeds, but uh, top and bottom for the BIA for Christmas lights as well as summer, summer events? Can that be done easily up front? Yes, we are working with the BIA to identify um, certain areas they have um, requirements for additional power for concerts and things right. such as that. So we are working that into our overall plan and we are looking at having um, GFIs in, in the poles um, to, to, for um, additional um, electrical feeds. But certainly uh, we are appreciate, working. Appreciate that. And later on in the report, it talks about coming back to the Accessibility Advisory Committee. Um, I look forward to talking about it there. Just out of curiosity, is there thought to having a curbless, increased curbless area in the handicapped parking spaces or uh, away from the bollards, you know, that type of thing that we can build into it uh, and build to the uh, coming new AODA standards? Um, as of today, we haven't looked at that as with the handicapped parkings, but it's certainly something we could take a look at to, and see how we can improve accessibility from those handicapped spots. All right, and the bridge was done early and it was great. What do we do on this project in terms of incent or penalize uh, for construction? Because it's a pretty tight timeline, but it's going to feel an awful lot longer. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, if it's okay with the councillor, uh, that's part of the presentation, uh, item number two. Yeah. Oh, uh, so if you I can know. patiently wait a few more minutes, uh, we'll, uh, we'll get to that. And then you can ask the same question again. You'll have to remind me. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, and I'd be happy to move that at the appropriate time, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Goodings. I will come back to you for that. Uh, Councillor Hutchins. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I, I wish to support Councillor O'Mara's uh, question of why only half of George Street is being done, because it seems if we're doing it, we should be doing the whole thing. Uh, Saturday... Uh, we hope it'll be get bigger, uh, the, the, the Saturday morning uh, farmer's market. So uh, we should be encouraging that and having more space for it to expand up. <clears throat> um, I want to ask, uh, uh, how long is this, uh, this uh, streetscape going to last? When's the next time we're going to do this? 50 years, 60 years? The, um, well, the asphalt is normally uh, 20 to 25 years for the asphalt. Um, the concrete uh, will normally lo last longer than that. I was thinking more of the, the sidewalks and everything else. Redoing all those. It, what if we make a mistake now? I mean, we want to change it to a flex street, that sort of thing. Which is, is it easier to go? Is it easier to go from a flex street to a sidewalk or from a sidewalk down to a flex street? Um, the challenge is that you, you really need to tie the grades in together with the road with the sidewalk to, for a flexible street. Um, it is challenging. Um, either, if you come back later, you'd have to raise the road up or you have to drop the sidewalk. And the sidewalks are normally tied into the uh, business uh, front doors. Um, so probably either way, it's probably a very difficult thing to kind of easily do to, to make it flexible or non-flexible in the future. Um, well, just if you had to, presumably... Uh, raising something is a lot easier than having to dig it down and then try and make it match up. 
Yeah, I guess, I guess if, theoretically, if we built what were proposed with the uh, raised curb and you wanted to go flexible, you, the easiest probably would be to raise the road up to tie into the sidewalk. Okay. Um, so we're talking about the cost of this. I'm obviously uh, someone, a proponent for option three, because I believe that this is going to be a, 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 something that we can bring people down and people will, it'll be something new, something to talk about. Also, as I, most of our, our major parades is along the whole of Lakeshore. It's not around just George Street. So, in my opinion, doing just George Street by itself doesn't really help. Um, so, I, I, I wanted to know, uh, page 24, number 10, you, you talk about there was a Appendix D in the PIC comments. Uh, Curbless street design is great was one of the major comments. And secondly, the curb list from T Thomas to Dunn is, is the better option. Uh, why, when the public has stated that they prefer having more curb list street, does we, do we come back to only just having it around the, the square? Through you, through you, Mr. Mayor. I think we have to, you know, we have to weigh the sort of the technical requirements uh, of the project with some comments that we get. Uh, for example, I know you would like to see us build a, a flexible street from Navy right to Allen. Now, we, the, in the case studies we've done, uh, where we've seen it done successfully is on roads that have lesser volumes of traffic. Uh, Lakeshore Road carries about 12 to 13,000 vehicles per day. Um, the way you separate pedestrians from uh, moving traffic uh, is by the use of bollards. Um, the bollards aren't crash, they're not crash proof. Um, where we have, um, at our intersections, we have uh, what we call bump outs. It's not really a technical term, but we call them bump outs to reduce the crossing distance across the street. So it makes it easier for pedestrian to cross the street. They're standing in a, in a bump out that under a non-flexible street option, they're sitting on a raised boulevard, which is separated by curb. But in a flexible street option, they're at grade with traffic separated by a cast aluminum bollard. Uh, it's the, the original study, the, the transportation master plan, which was presented to council and approved at the time, identified two festival areas, key festival areas in the downtown. One was in front of Town Square, naturally, and, and the, the design incorporated sort of an extension of Town Square, across Lakeshore Road as a flexible street, and up George Street. And to answer your earlier question, George Street would be done as part of a future uh, project, the balance of George Street. Second area was in front of Centennial Square, which would be a, a considered a festival uh, area, uh, as well a curbless uh, option. Um, we, and the work we've done, the case work we've done, the, 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 the maintenance that's required in like, you know, we do snow removal downtown. Um, I used to be involved in that, you may remember. Uh, the more bollards we have, the more difficult it is to remove snow. Um, we believe as staff, the right way to go is to stick with the original uh, recommendation from the downtown transportation study, which was to uh, create that focal point in front of town square. Um, we created a hybrid option, which would go to two blocks, um, if you would like. Um, the challenge with that is this the engineering challenge of having one side of the intersection at this grade and the other side of the intersection six inches higher. And how do we get it to drain? Um, we, can, we can make it work, but uh, our recommendation to you is to, to stick with the original downtown transportation recommendation, which was the festival street in front of town square only. The, uh, and, and sorry, and the, uh, I know you were, you were hinting at the cost um, um, I mean, we'll only know when we know, but uh, our work to date s seems to reveal about a 10% premium to go to uh, a full flexible street because the flexible street comes with a different type of road-based treatment uh, because it's uh, unit pavers. Uh, they have to be installed uh, differently than asphalt work, which is generally much more productive. Uh, the base is different. Um, you, you know, you're looking at a, a premium, um, uh, as well as the, the, drain, the drains that are required. You require long, longitudinal trench drains. So we believe it's in the, in the magnitude of 10%. Uh, 
Uh, we've, we've initially estimated this project at about $9 million, give or take. So you're looking at turning it into roughly a $10 million project if we went all the way. But it's, it's our best advice to, to council is to stick with the option with uh, uh, the flexible street in front of town square only. I've been doing some uh, research with the flexible streets and uh, a lot of them I've seen don't have bollards, in fact, to keep uh, the traffic separated. And um, there's one, for instance, in L London it's doing, uh, with th that's about, they're doing exactly the same thing as we are. They're digging up a, a fairly major street and they're putting in new infrastructure and they're having new uh, flex street and it's going to be roughly about the same size and I suspect much of the same traffic and they don't seem to have the sort of bollards that you're talking about in, involved with that. But on, so we're talking maybe $900,000 extra to go the flex street the whole way. I was asking how long the street was, the flex street was supposed to be lasting and as I said, 50 years doesn't seem a lot to pay for going that sort of length of time and it may help you with maintenance because one of the costs thing I wanted to know was what was the maintenance uh, costs and, uh, versus a flex street versus a regular street in clearing snow and doing that sort of thing. Uh, again through you Mr. Mayor, we, we, we are working with our, for our colleagues in Roads and Works uh, to develop a the maintenance costs going forward and I believe our report references that as part of the next uh, budget cycle we would be presenting options for you with regards to the costs. We are building a new public realm on Lakeshore Road. The maintenance costs will be higher uh, but I would, uh, my advice would be that if we went to an entire flexible street option the cost would be uh, higher. The removal is more important on a flexible street because the trench drains run continuous and generally all the snow is pushed right on top of the drains. Whereas now you have to go in and expose a catch basin every 60 meters or 70 meters. Now you're having to remove that snow right away. Um, it's, it's, I, I believe it's a significantly in increased uh, maintenance cost to go with uh, a flexible street. I, I, I don't have the ability to flip back, but Paul has a, a, the, the artist's 3D rendering, Paul. Um, that shows, um, yeah, and if you could see the area just um, sort of towards the left where you see the blue marquee with the Oakville logo, and you'll see that's a, uh, that's a bump out area. And um, I know you made a comment, uh, Councillor, about, well, you, you've seen options where they don't put the bollards. So how would you feel, and that's the question, how would you feel standing, a, a mother with a child uh, in a stroller, s standing in that bump out? Uh, waiting across the street and there's a absolutely no physical separation between you and, and traffic. Um, the bollard provides that visual, um, uh, uh, that visuality to the driver that they're, they're, he shouldn't or they shouldn't be driving in that area. Uh, they I'm, may do I'm it differently in other places of the world, but uh, yeah, the we, just, we just, we don't feel comfortable with that, with, with, with that option. Other places of the world are now removing traffic lights and removing all markings on roads and they're finding it actually having safer and less accidents than before. But uh, anyways, um, I will pass on that. I may come back for a second time. Councillor Hilger. A lot of questions have been asked. My only question is when we're doing this, I'd like to know how much redundancy we're building in under, underneath the roadway. And I'm thinking of conduits and things, which even if we threw them in now and they're empty, well, because we don't know what we don't know, what we might need going forward. Are we doing that? Yes, we do plan on installing some empty conduits for future infrastructure. Certainly that's part of our plan. I appreciate that because it, once we get it down, it'd be great not to have to rip it up for years. So whatever, the, the cost is so minimal. I'd appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Elgar. Next, uh, Councillor Liz Chen. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, thank you, Mr. Allen, for that uh, presentation. Uh, my question is regarding the Flex Street. Are there other places in Ontario that already implemented this type of uh, road? Um, yes, we, we have um, visited a number of municipalities that have um, implemented this type of road. Um, and do you have any, any data regarding safety with respect to the issues that were asked by other councillors with, uh, without having that separation? 
Um, we don't have any, any uh, safety data, but we do, um, the, the types of streets that we have toured tend to be lower traffic volume streets, as, as Mr. Cozy mentioned. Um, I believe Kingston may, their street may have been comparable to Lakeshore Road, but the majority of the municipalities were more of a low volume, lower speed types of streets. And uh, there's a number of years that they've already been implemented in, in those cities? The one, the one that I, comes to mind right away is, is in Guelph, on Cardin Avenue, Cardin Road, Cardin Avenue, right near their city hall. Uh, but it, it compares more to Thomas Street, quiet, not much traffic. Uh, there's business frontage on there. Um, that's, that's the one that's coming to mind right now. Um, and I see that our CAO may have some comments. And as well. uh, your Guelph Street's fairly short as well. I've been it's there. It's a short section, correct, Mr. 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 Green. Uh, to you, uh, Mayor Burton, thank you very much. Uh, to members of council, I think one of the closest uh, flag streets that I'm aware of is in the city of Mississauga. They built a flag street between Prince of. Y Duke of York and the next street to the west between City Hall and Celebration Square. That entire section of road was built as a flex street. They left it in place for about a year and a half as a, a both pedestrian and a vehicular traffic and determined that it was, there were safety concerns because of the mixture of pedestrians and traffic and they have now had that road closed for I believe about three years. So vehicles cannot access it anymore. So there's, you know, a prime example where there was concerns about the mixture. Now, admittedly, there was an attraction on both sides, having a city hall, of course, and, a, and Celebration Square, but that's a prime example of a moderate volume street. Uh, I would say probably less traffic than Lakeshore Road, but certainly more than a local street, and they closed it. So is, isn't that an issue for us? So I think uh, staff's position is that the treatments they're giving um, mitigate against the safety issue and, and taking out the bollards, would, that's why they're, they're recommending the bollards. That's what this submission amounts to. And the street Mr. Green just referred to is, is actually quite short, uh, by the way. Uh, been there many times. Um, uh, Councillor Grant, if Councillor Chin has done, Councillor Grant. Thank you, and uh, I appreciate the report. Uh, I think anybody reading it can understand a lot of the issues that you bring up about curbless streets and non-curbless streets. The, the question I have is, for that little area we do have, it's been mentioned that pooling is a concern on a curbless street. What do we plan to do about mitigating that water? Where is that going to go in that section of curbless street? Is it going to just settle in the middle? There will be um, um, tre dra trench drains along the, air the length of the curbless section, so and the grades well are being designed to properly drain to that trench drain. Okay, so it'll be raised somewhat in the center of the street, so it'll flow down, or? Um, it'll be, um, well, there'll, there'll be longitudinal drainage on the road, plus um, coming across the side to the trench drain. So there will be a low point where the water will um, be directed to. Um, actually, the, the area of the Kerbal Street is actually the low point um, of the grade along the section of Lakeshore Road, so uh, drainage should not be an issue with, with the option one. That's all I want to know. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councillor. I think maybe now we could turn to the public delegations. Councillor Hutchins. Yeah, I have, sorry, I have one other a question. But, uh, uh, if you have a, a, a trench drains uh, tr going down the street and, and you had a heated sidewalk, does that help to make sure that the sidewalks are clear and drained? Does that reduce uh, maintenance and, and having to remove snow and some of the issues like that? Um, a heated heat sidewalk would maintain the uh, snow off the sidewalk. However, it would still be a problematic for the roadway. Um, you're still pushing quite a volume of snow off the road um, towards the boulevard area. So the heated sidewalks wouldn't melt all the snow um, from the right away. So we out going into a for, for a curbless street, just draining into this 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 drains and basically keeping it clear. Part of our work over the last few years is was to look at heating the sidewalks, Councillor Hutchins, and um, 
the one way to do it is you need a system, a glycol system. Um, and it's uh, a series of tubes uh, underneath the sidewalk throughout. I'm sure you're familiar with that. But the glycol has to be pumped. You need pumping stations at every, uh, every block. We don't have the space to put the pumping stations. Um, it would be wonderful to have uh, heated sidewalks. I think our operations people would thank us tremendously. I think the public would love them, but they're not very feasible. I know the city of Montreal talked a big story about uh, heating the sidewalks on uh, St. Catherine Street, I believe it was, and they went away from it because it's just not feasible. And it is extremely, extremely expensive. And if there's ever a utility issue, uh, if something goes down in the middle of the block, the whole block won't work because you have to shut down the, uh, uh, the section from um, a valve to valve, which would essentially be the, the entire block. So we, we looked at costs. We looked at this a few years ago and had uh, indicated to council that the cost was just prohibitive and we just couldn't see the practical implement implementation here. So unfortunately, whether it's a good idea or not, it's just not feasible here in our downtown. So now perhaps I'll ask the clerk to call our delegations. Our only listed delegation for this item is Charlene Pluman from the downtown Oakville business improvement area. Ms. Pluman, welcome. Council looks forward to your information. And if, if, as I understand, you might like to speak to the entire suite of items, then feel free to. Okay, I, I'm happy to do that. Um, if it would save everyone some time, I'm happy to do that. I'm going to apologize. I've, I've come with a pharmacy with me. I'm, I'm quite ill today. I'm prepared to wipe down after I've been here and everything. So uh, I do apologize if I get a coughing fit partway through this because it will likely happen. So I'm sorry about that. I do have handouts uh, for everybody. They're, they're very boring. So for the, uh, the people in the peanut gallery, you don't even want to see them because they're boring. Um, but I do have for the future presentation um, or the future delegation for the next topic, I have handouts for that as well and I do have a presentation for that if, uh, if it could be so loaded, that's great and if not, I've got uh, visual copies, so both. Uh, in terms of this particular pro um, topic, it's funny because it's, it's sort of hitting right on where we were coming from as a BIA. So this is for the next uh, section and if it can be loaded, it's fairly obvious it's the only thing on there, but if it can't be, then they've got that. Um, we also had a very interested uh, view on the flex street and having the entire street as a flex street, so option three, but we did have some questions about it, and so we were asking that um, until we are able to get those questions answered, we would like to defer giving an opinion. I know we want to wrap this up today. If it's possible to have these questions answered, I might be able to give an opinion right now, um, but uh, we have interest in it, but we have some of the same concerns that people are sharing. So the questions that we would uh, have and the concerns about it is um, snow removal is one. We get a lot of feedback from the businesses and from the customers that they would like greater snow removal. And when we hear that snow removal could be hindered by having the flex street and the bullards, that makes us pause. So we like the concept of flexibility and being able to do things in the future, but um, have a concern about the snow removal. So that was a question. Um, we were concerned about the indication in the report that there's an added length of time for the project. If it's a short, you know, an extra month or two, okay. If it's an extra two years, then, you know, maybe not so much. So, and then also the ability to get in and out of your car door. So how close would these bullards be to where people are parking? And would you have to strategically park so that you wouldn't be opening your door into a bullard? Um, I would hasten to say that there's some people who are not really comfortable with parallel parking and to have to park just so, so that they could open their door would be a consideration. So we just had some questions that before we could say, we like option three, we like option one, um, that we would like to have addressed. So if they can be addressed today, then great. If they can't, we do have a board meeting on uh, Wednesday, April 18th, so in very short order. And if between now and then, I was able to speak with the staff and have some of these questions answered, the board could then talk about that on the 18th and provide our answer to council forthwith. So that is our preference, that we are able to provide those, get those answers and speak as a board and make that decision on the 18th and provide that to council. But we are um, in favor of a lot of the pros for Flex Street should these other cons be addressed. Um, otherwise, we would also like confirmation that there will be further consultation on what I've said here is the granular details because it's been very high level at this point. So things like the receptacles that uh, Councillor Giddings brought up, things like if we're putting in a pedestrian counter, 
What does that look like? We would be very interested in having one that can collect the right type of data, how frequently that person comes, where their geographical location is from, how long they're staying. And this can be collected through cell phones by, by ways of, of uh, different um, counters and different software. And we'd like those things to be considered and uh, would be willing um, with the, if the cost was appropriate to help share in the cost of putting in that type of a counter versus another one. So we just are hopeful that these granular details, things like outlets and tree wells, we know we have to talk to forestry to say how we're going to light these trees and keep the health of these trees we're putting in. But tree lighting is important in place making and creating an enjoyable place. The amount of times we get sent pictures of Naples saying do this and primarily it's things like tree lighting. So let's address that now. I know it's a huge conversation on how to light them safely in the health of the trees. Let's set that aside but let's put receptacles in the tree wells to make sure we have options going forward. These type of questions we're hopeful are still on the table and can still be discussed uh, because that level of detail has not been talked about to, to date. So assuming that those level details we can still have input on and consultation on, then we have um, no other changes that we want to address or speak to about the final streetscape design. Questions for Ms. Pluman? Thank you very much for your information. Uh, Mr. Cozy, any answers for Ms. Pluman? Um, Start with the, 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 the latest questions first. Sure. That's how I'm remembering. Um, there's going to be a lot of receptacles along Lakeshore Road. All the poles are going to have receptacles. They're going to be integrated. They're not going to be aftermarket installed outside the pole that don't work. They're actually going to be on a separate circuit. So if, uh, if um, we overload something or if the street light uh, network goes down, um, you have a dedicated circuit for the receptacles. There'll be um, localized um, receptacles. In addition to the poles, there'll be some at knee height level in uh, the planting beds. And that's where we still have to just sit down with, with you and representatives of the BIA and uh, resolve exactly where they're going to be because we know that sometimes the pole's not in the exact right location where you need the receptacle. And again, those would also be on its own dedicated circuit. So I know that's been a challenge in the past. With regards to the, um, the pedestrian and traffic counters, I can't give you an answer now and I can't give you an answer for several months yet because we haven't selected the hardware uh, for the smart city. We're currently engaging a consultant to help us with uh, a plan uh, to procure the various types of hardware that uh, we require. Uh, we'll be following back up with Council uh, in the future on that. Uh, the, the goal is to implement as much hardware as we can with the project, whether it's done by our contractor or by um, uh, a separate vendor as a, in, a, in a coordinated effort with our contractor. Um, so Mr. so we would show you, we would show you the, the types that we're proposing, what they do, how they work, and uh, certainly get your thoughts on that. So, so on council's behalf, I just want to zero in on that particular answer. Does that mean that um, when you bring that to council, the BIA will have been fully consulted and, and had an, all the time they need to take a position? Yes, that's our intention, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Did that capture all your questions? The earlier ones, sorry, the, the, the about the snow removal, I, I you know, um, the, the car doors and the bollards was next, I think. Yeah. Um, I don't have a problem if we had until Wednesday to, to uh, uh, provide those answers to you, but uh, I would like this resolved <laughs> shortly thereafter because we have to tender this project. We have a lot of work still to do, and I don't want to delay this uh, for a month. If this is a few weeks delay, um, uh, I'm okay with that. But I, you know, I, I think I made it clear earlier in my answer to Councillor Hutchins' question that certainly the, the, the level of effort required to uh, maintain a flexible street is higher than, than what it would on a conventional street. You, you, the storage, it just doesn't work out the same way. Um, the removal of the bollards uh, or getting in between the bollards with equipment uh, is uh, challenging because in the past we've, 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 removed, we've removed benches in the wintertime so our equipment can get in between the trees and the lights to, to remove the snow. But you really don't want to remove the bollards because they're there to protect the pedestrians. So it's just a much slower uh, process uh, and, and more costly. But uh, as I said, I mean, if, if I didn't cover all the answers uh, to Ms. Pluman's uh, questions, I could in a few days. Well, it sounds like you did answer her question on snow removal. And uh, as I understood you, you're basically saying that 
the hybrid solution may fit the preference she expressed that uh, snow removal has a higher priority than, you know, better snow removal outweighs more flex street is what I heard her to say. And that's mm -hmm. what I heard you to answer. Thank you. And, and I, um, if I have the time, just wanted to uh, also acknowledge Council O'Meara's suggestion about the, um, you know, bike racks and was a more artistic option. To my knowledge, I didn't see a more artistic option and I would welcome one. So I, I remember seeing, here's a traditional one, here's a contemporary one, here's, but they were all posts. Um, and when, whether it's all of them or whether it's a few, um, we're looking within the BIA to say, okay, how can we do what we call interactive beautifications, things that are beautiful to look at, but also useful and, and people can interact with them. Um, so we would welcome that, uh, you know, if it was one per block or whatever have you, um, we would welcome looking at helping to support even the cost of that for beautification wise. So um, we would, you know, gladly see some more interesting bollards than, uh, or bike racks than just a, a post. So thank you for that. Um, and our thank you to the um, town for trying to save those signature trees that are there. Those six trees do really help place make and the best we can save them. Uh, I know it sort of comes down to, to a lot of factors, but uh, our thanks to the town for trying to save those, those trees. And then I, I'm happy to continue on with speaking to the mitigation uh, report, or I'm happy to come back up once everyone's had a chance to hear other discussion. Why don't we call you back up and give you a full 10 minutes on the next one? Wonderful. Thank you. Thank I, you. I sense that would suit you better. Uh, yes, that would good. be wonderful. Well, it's always, always good to guess right. All right. Uh, item one, which is to receive the report and to endorse option one, and uh, the uh, and and make the light standard uh, new rather than refurbish is moved by Councillor Giddings. Uh, is there discussion, or shall I put the vote, Councillor O'Meara? Thank you, Worship. I, I'm just wondering, um, after hearing um, Charlene's comments about the bike racks, is, is that something that we might be able to address as we move forward? I mean, or does that have to be involved in this RFP right now about maybe looking at some kind of flair or some sort of art? Uh, um, around the, the bike hold. Is that something that we need to decide right now or is that something that we could maybe take a look at when we go down the road or how, how, how should we proceed to address that and especially if the BIA is offering to even uh, cost share on, on perhaps some of that? Uh, through you, Ms. Merritt, I'm, I'm going to suggest that the, for the bike rack specifically, that was a specific item that was consulted through the public. It does reflect the traditional character um, that we wanted to maintain, very much part of what the Heritage Committee wanted. Um, so in terms of the bike ring itself, I think that was an item Council had dealt with. It's been dealt with and we'd be proceeding along that path if, uh, if we didn't hear anything else from Council tonight. Okay. That's uh, in terms of other kinds of things that can happen, in terms of flair in the downtown, yeah, there is a lot more small details that will be sorted out as we move through on the design, but some of those features are um, determined now. Fair enough. I'm, I'm okay with that. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor. Are there other members of the public f with information for Council on this file? Mr. Nibbler. Thanks. I'm George Schniblock with the Oakville Lakeside Residents Association. We're directly south of the lakeshore uh, in downtown. Um, one thing there wasn't a lot of conversation on tonight was the pedestrian crossings at the corners. And I noticed that uh, at Thomas Street, Dunn, and Reynolds, uh, where the uh, PXO crossings are to be located, there's only now a crossing on one side of the street to cross Lakeshore rather than on all four sides. Um, the thought on that is uh, that if you don't provide uh, markings for a crossing, it's not going to stop people from crossing on the other side of the intersection where they're used to crossing now rather than going around three sides to get back to where they want to go. Um, so I think that causes a little bit, it makes it a little less safe actually. Um, the PXO crossings themselves um, sort of question whether that's a necessary addition, um, especially that there are now going to be bump outs 
to the road. One of the things that makes it harder to cross down to the Lakeshore Road right now is that it's uh, three lanes plus the parking lanes. With the bump outs, it's a lot shorter. And I think that certainly makes it safer and will encourage people to cross the road, which is good for a downtown. Also, there was some public comment about uh, previously about uh, the PXO crossings. There's a lot of visual clutter with them, additional signage and uh, some sort of structure that hangs over the street, which seems unfortunate. On the Flex Street, we did support uh, Flex Street for all of Lakeshore. Um, you know, I, I understand the concerns about, uh, particularly about uh, snow removal. Um, it seems to me uh, safety is somewhat mitigated by uh, the cars parking on the road, uh, rather than just bollards. Cars parking uh, protect the uh, pedestrians. And the last time I tried uh, driving up a curb, my car wasn't stopped by the curb. Um, <laughs> You can still drive on the sidewalk if you really want to. We won't ask you for closer detail. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, um, and then uh, Councillor O'Meara's suggestion of uh, George Street uh, totally makes sense to me that that street in that it's used for the market and uh, hopefully other things would be ideal. Um, I would have thought the drainage is not such a big deal on that street since it slopes down to the lakeshore. Uh, be nice to see the Flex Street go up there at minimum. Uh, on the lighting, the lighting that has been installed already in the bridge, I'm assuming that's the same lighting that we're talking about putting through the rest of downtown now, uh, which is beautiful light standards. The actual bulbs, and if I've got this right, it's the 3,000 Kelvin LED lights, are still much bluer and colder than the current uh, warm glow in downtown Oakville. So it'd be nice as I, the technology improves if they can go to warmer style LED bulbs. And I also support the maintenance of the um, five or six trees that have been identified as possible to, uh, to maintain. Um, there are some really nicely sized trees downtown and uh, a lot of our residents, um, you know, would like to take various trees off their properties and aren't allowed to. Uh, it'd be nice if some of the good ones were kept downtown as well. So we appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Niblock. Councillor Hutchins has a question for you. Yes, hi, Mr. Niblock. Uh, color temperature is 3,000 Kelvin. It's the same color, whether it's incandescent bulb, LED bulb, quartz halogen bulb. It makes no difference. It's the color temperature. So what changes it? Why is it different? Well, the ones I believe down there are actually 4,000. They're 3,000. I'd have to ask, uh, ask that. They tend to look brighter because there's a smaller emission area. So the, the, the brightness is there, but the color temperature is the color temperature. They're, they're 3,000, and uh, sometimes the contrast is more stark when they're installed and you have older uh, uh, high-pressure sodium lights in the vicinity. Uh, so they may look more white or blue, as you said, than they, they would be. but. There are 3,000. We went through this uh, about a year or two years ago. Uh, it was a long evening, and um, we, 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 we've, we've got councils buying to go with 3,000 at the well, time. Well, suffice it to say, there were fans of every color. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Niblock. All right, council, I'm going to call the vote if there's no further discussion. All those in favor of Councilor Giddings' motion? Any opposed? That carries, thank you very much. Now, um, if I can find my way to the next page. The downtown mitigation strategy update is a, we have a presentation from Dorothy St. George and Dan Cozy. We have registered delegations from the downtown Oakville BIA 
and a uh, shopkeeper there. And, uh, and this is an item to receive the information. Um, and I would ask uh, your attention now be given to uh, Ms. St. George. Thank you, Mayor Burton, and good, good evening, members of council. Uh, as Mr. Allen indicated, the Lakeshore Streetscape project will deliver some much needed infrastructure rehabilitation to Lakeshore Road, um, but it would also refresh the appeal uh, and the look of this important commercial district. It's a $10 million investment and it's gonna yield some positive outcomes. But to get there, it's recognized that during the construction period, there will be an impact on businesses in the area. And so, as you're aware, a mitigation strategy is being developed to reduce that impact. So this presentation and report before you tonight provides an update on the status of this strategy. There are many people involved in the development of the mitigation strategy. We have formed an internal uh, mitigation team with representation from these departments, economic development, engineering and construction, parks and open space, planning, urban design, recreation and culture, and we also have uh, Ms. Pluman as a representative from the downtown BIA. There are three people that you are going to be seeing and the merchants downtown are going to be seeing on a regular basis with regard to this project. And the first is uh, Mr. Paul Allen, and you've um, had a presentation from him this evening. And the second um, is uh, an individual by the name of Mary Valley, who's in the audience with us tonight. There she is. Um, and she was hired on contract this year uh, as the Senior Liaison and Communication Advisor. And as her title indicates, she'll be taking the lead role on the communication, ongoing communication between the town, the construction company, and the various stakeholders with this project. Mary has experience working with BIAs in Kitchener, East London, Pape Village, Acton, Burlington, and Oshawa. And most recently, she was contracted to assist in the building, in building the marketing and sponsorship structure for Toronto Union Station. So she has a lot of experience to bring um, in assistance for this project. Uh, the third person will be a marketing and communications assistant. Uh, and that is a part-time role. It is currently vacant, uh, vacant, but will be posted shortly. Now, this is a major project, and as you're aware, it will, will occur in stages. And the first stage dealt with the inputs for the project. Council approved a preliminary budget that provided some funding to construct or uh, construct a project office in the downtown core, as well as the funding to hire Mary Valley in the communications liaison role. The other inputs are the staff resources on the mitigation team, some consultants that we have brought on board to develop a three-year marketing and communications plan, and the various stakeholders that we have been engaging on this project. We're at the second stage right now, which is the strategy development, and a framework was brought to you uh, to council last year that outlined these elements. And you'll be hearing from Dan uh, a little bit later in this presentation about construction mitigation. We are also exploring marketing and communications, economic, urban design, and events. Some of these initiatives are already planned and will be implemented, and others are being explored. So there's a tendency to want to jump to the final outcome and see this project completed, but we know that there's going to be some initial outcomes. So if you think about 2018, what we're developing are relationships. We're engaging stakeholders around this project. We're undertaking various problem solving, looking at, for example, the events that could be planned and how can we readjust the events that are taking place working with the BIA to make sure that people are continuing to come downtown during the construction period. We're raising awareness of the project. We're developing tools to make sure that there's open and um, very transparent communication about the project. And we're also looking at developing an innovation hub at the former post office site, um, at the remaining of the first floor to create an innovation hub for tech-based projects and events. 
These are the intermediate outcomes that we expect during the construction period. So we're looking at the time frame 2019 and 2020. We'll be implementing mitigation options to increase the number of visitors coming downtown. We want to sustain the operations of the businesses in this district and through that innovation hub, build the entrepreneurial ecosystem in downtown. And lastly are the long-term outcomes, a revitalized commercial district. Everyone really wants to skip all those other stages and land here. We want to get to that final outcome where we're well positioned for the downtown cultural hub, where the downtown has been refreshed, it's attractive and energized and it draws new investment to that area. While we're in a hurry to realize those long-term outcomes, we recognize that progress is well underway. Here's a list of the achievements to date, and I won't go through this list in, in detail, but just highlight a few of them. The most notable is that picture of the uh, completed Lakeshore, Ridge, Lakeshore Road bridge reconstruction that was done last year. We hired the senior liaison and communication advisor and we launched the Honk mobile application, which is really getting wonderful feedback from those users. Now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dan Cozy to talk about the construction project itself and some of the planned mitigation initiatives. Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, through you, Chair uh, Giddings. Um, start off, before we get into the... Uh, the project itself, um, we want to talk about some things that are occurring this year uh, uh, to get ready for next year. Um, you'll recall that uh, there's a plan in place to convert all the existing one-way streets to two-way. We've already completed the conversion of Navy Street to two-way operation uh, just prior to the start of the uh, bridge project. We plan to complete the, the uh, one-way conversions to two-way uh, later this year. And associated with that, because we have to uh, blast off all the pavement markings, uh, we are, and the roads themselves are actually quite aged in the downtown, uh, we are going to be uh, doing uh, some resurfacing work in the downtown as well, so that when we paint the roads, you're just going to see the new lines, and you're not going to see the old lines uh, faded out uh, with the new lines. It, it'll just be cleaner and less confusing. Um, obviously, we have to finalize the design. Uh, the streetscape work is pretty much done. Uh, we have some, some grading uh, things to work out. Uh, we're really focusing on the utility work that has to occur uh, in, um, uh, in concert with our construction project. The downtown project office, which we're really keen on, is going to open uh, later this spring. Uh, as you know, that's uh, going to be located at the Canada Post Office building, the former Canada Post Office building, uh, street, street level. Um, Merchants, residents, visitors, anyone can uh, drop in, um, uh, see uh, plans. Uh, we'll have that uh, virtual reality uh, tool that uh, we used at our public meeting, which Mr. Allen talked about, uh, which was quite cool. I really enjoyed that, uh, wearing those goggles and uh, looking at what, uh, looking through and seeing what the, the downtown would look like. We, we'll have that available running on a, on a TV. Um, uh, we'll have uh, potentially have samples of some of the um, uh, features uh, in the uh, in the uh, display room, and as well, people will be able to reach out to someone if they have questions. Uh, our, uh, our our senior liaison officer, uh, coordinator Mary, will be there, uh, as well as other uh, individuals. Our actual construction office will be located there. Uh, our contractor will have his or her uh, main office located there as part of the project. Our site staff will be there. Uh, we plan to host uh, project meetings uh, in, a, in a room uh, in, the, uh, in the office and uh, we plan to have uh, 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 community liaison meetings where we're going to invite uh, uh, representatives of the community, the business community, the residential community, our local councillors and the mayor uh, and uh, Mary will actually be uh, uh, chairing those meetings uh, and um, our uh, construction, our contractor and our, and, the, and our engineering project team will be participants and we're really looking forward to working with Mary uh, in the project office. The ongoing patio pilot project, that's something we started a few years ago, that will continue um, in 2018. It will uh, also continue 
uh, in the uh, first year of the, uh, the construction in other areas where we're not working. Obviously, we can't have the patios uh, operating in the area that we're working on, but uh, we'll continue with the pilot project. Uh, public consultation on Town Square is going to start very soon. So uh, one of the things is um, we, we need to include whatever it is we're going to do with Town Square um, to re revitalize it, uh, re refurbish it. Uh, we, we are going to do that with our road construction project because we don't want to go in with a separate construction tender after we're done to <laughs> Lakeshore and then start all over again on Town Square. Uh, I know the f uh, a firm has been retained through our colleagues in Park and op Open Space. I spoke to Mr. Mark today and they plan to come back to you in July uh, with a final design. And, uh, and from there, we'll, uh, we'll include that work in our, uh, in our call. Um, we are in the process, our planning staff are, are finalizing urban design guidelines for the downtown. So that's for both private and public realm enhancements uh, when there's new development. And uh, there'll be consultation on the mitigation options that uh, Dorothy and I are speaking about uh, tonight. And uh, we'll be complete, <coughs> excuse me, we'll be completing and implementing a marketing and communication plan, which uh, is being led by um, uh, Dorothy and, and Mary. <coughs> so this just shows your project uh, timeline um, starting 2018, what I've really just talked about as we move into 2019. We've said all along that the Lakeshore Road project had to be phased over two years, um, three blocks at a time. Year one would be Navy to, um, Navy to um, uh, Dunn, and uh, year two would be from Dunn to uh, Allen. And um, um, I want to make it clear that when we say three blocks at a time, um, I want you to appreciate that our contractor will be doing work and our utility partners will be doing work. And our utility partners and our contractor cannot work on top of one another. Typically what happens is the utility people are ahead of you. Uh, we're trying to avoid having a third operation where we go in with the utility relocations this year <laughs> and, and then start our construction project next year. So we've embedded all the work except for gas. gas um, their health and safety requirements will not allow them to partner in our contract. But Bell, Hydro, uh, Kojiko, um, they will be, they, we will carry their contractors in our main contract. But what will happen is as we move into block one, Bell, Kojiko, or Gas, or Hydro will be in block two. So two blocks will be occupied when we start. And as we move along, we'll be into the third block because we need the utilities and all the operations to stay ahead. Otherwise, we're going to be stepping on our, ourselves and we're going to slow things down. So the reality is, is that we're going to have all three blocks being worked on for most of the time. And I just need to be, be clear. It, I know there's been some discussion about, well, can this be done block by block? And um, unfortunately, the answer is no. Um, so we are um, uh, going to do those three blocks uh, from the beginning of April, late March, if the weather uh, allows us. Uh, certainly this past winter hasn't been a great uh, March, but if we get a better March, we'll start early. And uh, the plan is to be done before Santa Claus Parade, just, just like the bridge. But we hope to be done sooner if we can. And then we would um, uh, allow the business community to uh, have a, uh, a Christmas shopping season. Uh, without any construction activity and then we would start again same process the following year uh, in uh, starting in around March or April of 2020 uh, same thing with the other with the other three blocks so in terms of the mitigations that are more specific to the project itself um, we are going to um, move forward with a pre-qualification program um, Typically when we issue a tender, um, we call for tenders, we receive them, we open the bids, as long as the, the contractor has you know, the required experience, has all the bid bonds, all the insurance requirements, generally the low bid wins the, wins the day. And sometimes people think that that's a bad thing. And, um, and I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, uh, but to protect ourselves to, at a higher level with regards to the downtown and how important it is, we're gonna pre-qualify which means we're going to ask for pre-qualification submissions from, from uh, the, the open call 
and any contractor could submit uh, the documents and um, they'll have to prove to us that they meet certain minimum requirements in terms of how they stage the work, their health and safety reputation, uh, the types of work, similar work like, like what we're proposing. And then from that, we're gonna have a short list. Um, and, from, and only the shortlisted contractors will be bidding on the project. And uh, from there, what we expect is to award a contract to someone that's uh, qualified to a higher degree than our typical uh, projects. Uh, in terms of construction phasing, and I think this is where Councillor Giddings earlier is uh, asking a question, and um, I think he'll, he'll be interested uh, to hear this as well as uh, the rest of Council. Um, we learned a lot from our Lakeshore Road, uh, uh, our Lakeshore Bridge project. Uh, we had a bonus penalty provision in there. As you know, we finished early uh, on budget. Uh, even, you know, we paid the bonus. Uh, the contractor did uh, what he was required to do. Um, so that is a good way to incent uh, earlier completion. And we plan to use that uh, as well. Um, extended hours of our construction. Uh, this is something we've already spoken with our, the BIA. I believe the consensus opinion, and, and I could be corrected if I'm wrong, the consensus is work as long as you can uh, every day of the week. Um, and that's what we tried to do with the bridge project. Um, Monday to Saturday, and we made it clear in the contract, the contractor could work daylight hours. Didn't work out that way though, because there's a thing called uh, collective agreements, uh, and the contractor was a balancing act between uh, paying the overtime associated with working the extra hours and uh, achieving the bonus. So uh, when, with the bridge contractor, they just decided to work harder with more people during the day rather than pay you know, scheduled overtime on Saturdays and, and uh, and weekdays. And just as an example, um, on a weekday, on a standard 10 hour construction day, a contractor's uh, premium on overtime is about 45% on labor per day. Uh, on a Saturday, it could be as high as 100% based on what the collective agreement rates are. So we have to be careful. We, 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 if we say you must work daylight hours to the contractor, we're gonna pay for it. It's gonna be embedded in the price of the contract. If we simply say to the contractor, this is the schedule, we expect you to complete it here. If you complete it earlier, there's this bonus provision, and if you complete it later, there's this penalty, um, then you, you, the contractor decides how they would deliver the project. We would again allow them to move to work uh, the additional hours, but we have to be careful, and we haven't uh, uh, decided just yet um, whether we would uh, require the, uh, the additional hours or whether we would make it an option, uh, but be very stringent on the completion time frame. And like I said, it worked quite well with the, uh, the Lakeshore Bridge. Coordinated pedestrian vehicle access. This is gonna be really important on this project because we have to close the road when we're working on the road, but we have businesses fronting onto the road and we have to have some type of access to the, to the businesses. So we expect a high level of uh, coordination by our contractor. And that's gonna be one of the things we're gonna be um, uh, highly rating with regards to the pre-qualification process. I'd be a liar if I stood here and told you there's gonna be no problems. Everything's gonna be perfect. Uh, everyone will be able to get into the storefronts 24/7, and uh, that that would that'd be doing a, 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 a really I do everyone a disservice here by saying that. There's going to be some times um, when uh, things we have to replace a water main service to uh, a, a particular storefront. That sto that water main service or the sanitary service might be right underneath the door. Uh, when we dig a hole in front of the door, it's gonna be very difficult to get you in and out of the door. So we're gonna to have to minimize these disruptions and with the help of Mary, uh, we need to coordinate this at a high level and we need a contractor that's going to, um, that's going to work with us. Uh, temporary signage and wayfinding isn't gonna be important during the construction project, as well as, you know, I'm, I kind of laughed here when I wrote this, I said a clean work site. Um, as clean as possible. I mean, it's not going to be pristine, but uh, we'd like to keep it clean and organized with well delineated fences so that the pedestrians can get to where they have to get without having to walk over things they're not supposed to walk over. As I said, we have our senior liaison communications advisor. We're look, really looking forward to working with Mary. And uh, again, the project office at 163 Church Street is gonna be up and running and it'll be open uh, this year. We're not waiting for, for next year to come around before we open it. Marketing communication plan, I know that work is already in process. Smart city technologies, we talked a bit about that uh, earlier this evening. Um, 
yes, we are preserving uh, uh, to the highest extent possible. Yes, a lot of the smart city stuff Councillor O'Meara was talking about earlier, a lot of it's not uh, uh, hardwired. Um, a lot of it's Wi-Fi based, uh, cellular based. You don't have to have <clears throat> necessarily have communication. We're looking at uh, having fiber optics available on both sides of the street. We're looking at, um, uh, you, you, know, you have to provide power. <laughs> you need a power source. Uh, uh, I don't know how many of these features operate on batteries, but you know, we'd like to have our, our features uh, electrified. So um, it'll be a combination of everything. And uh, we will be getting back to you with what the, we believe the platform should be and how we would deliver those as part of each phase of the project. Town Square, talked about it briefly a few minutes ago, but that has to be included as part of our project. Um, already mentioned the pilot patio program and parking. Uh, we haven't said too much about parking tonight. Um, we are looking to create new spaces where we can. I could tell you that we're, I know our parking enterprise people are building a new parking lot off of Water Street. It's gonna be called Lot 14. It's located between the two bridges on the west side of Water Street. That'll be uh, surfaced as a new parking lot. The north end of Navy Street, there's some parking on the street, it's sort of like a little mini lot. There'll be a few more spaces added over there. We're looking at other options uh, to create more spaces. I know there was some suggestions made at the meeting with the BIA a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and we want to make use of technologies where we can uh, to make it easier. I know Dorothy mentioned about the honk application, which is uh, pretty good. Uh, it allows you the ability to buy parking from your telephone. Uh, without having to go back to the machine. So that's it for my part of the presentation. I think Dorothy's just going to sum up. Thanks, Dan. So uh, in conclusion, this is a construction project, but it's got a big economic impact, and we're all aware of that, and we're all aware that there's a need for a mitigation strategy. This report before you provides the mitigation update at this point in time. And the mitigation options that have been outlined for you tonight primarily relate to the construction project itself. And as I indicated earlier, there are other mitigation options being explored. We do hear from the BIA that parking is uh, um, certainly a concern for those downtown. And as Dan indicated, we're looking at ways to make parking more convenient for the, through the provision of new parking spaces, through new technologies, through new services, whether or not there may be an option to provide valet services during the construction period. We are also costing uh, subsidies. We hear that from the BIA. We'd like to have free parking downtown. We will be looking the, at those costs and bringing those costs forward when we bring a final report to Council. But there are other mitigation measures that we're exploring as well, whether it's workshops, targeted workshops for the retailers, pop-up stores, new events, and so forth. And all of those are being explored, and Mary is out already consulting with the merchants and getting a feel for where their priorities are. Um, internally, we're costing the various options. So we're going to bring back those priorities and those, co those costs together with a final recommend recommendation report to you uh, towards the end of this year. So really the next steps are uh, exploration and costing. Um, I think that's about it. <laughs> final report, end of the year, and we're open for any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Director St. George and Cozy. Uh, Mayor Burton was called away, and so as Acting Mayor, I will be uh, presiding over the rest of the meeting. We do have some questions. Councillor O'Meara. Thank you much, uh, very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dorothy and Dan, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I did notice on one it said the consultation on mitigation. So um, we've had actually we got a, um, a letter from the chamber they're here in attendance as well they've got some great ideas on some programs and projects that have been done in a variety of other um, um, areas that are going through this in particular we were discussing earlier about the king street pilot project in toronto and some of the various programs that they've put in place um, so um, if we can ensure that we touch base with the chamber I, I know they've got some great ideas on some programs that might need a little meat on the bones from the town i'm sure um, that would be appreciated to, to them and 
and, and I know to myself as well. So thank you for that. I'd just like to mention that. Thank you. That's for you, Mr. Chair. Um, Dan and his team have been out consulting with various municipalities on the construction side and mitigation uh, in, um, in that regard. But we are also out um, doing some best practice research, looking at how other communities have approached mitigation options. So not just on the construction side, but on events and uh, uh, marketing and communications and economic measures. So we will certainly be doing that. I was meeting with the chamber this morning and we talked about uh, uh, meeting with them and certainly their input would be welcome. Thank you, Councillor Chisholm. Thank you. No, that was my uh, statement too with respect to the Chamber of Commerce being involved in as much as possible where they could assist in the uh, mitigation. Thank you. Councillor Hutchins. Thank you very much. I, I've got three questions. The first one uh, from page uh, 32, achievements to date. Uh, it says two-way conversion of Navy Street completed. Uh, in one way, yes. In another way, no, because of how do you turn left on Randall when Randall's a two-way as well? Turn left onto Navy, and th that's that. How do we solve that problem? Going west, I'm talking about. Well, we're we're going to we're going to convert Randall Street to two-way operation, yeah. and. Uh, At present, at the intersection at Randall and Navy, you cannot turn left. You have to go over the bridge and turn round, or you. I thought turn right. we removed. No, we removed the sign, mm -hmm. councillors. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. We prevented that move during the mm -hmm. uh, bridge construction because there was con some some safety concerns with the amount of traffic that was bypassing the the bridge, which was closed. That was moved about. Yeah, yeah, removed about that, four weeks it, ago. Yeah, that, that oh, was moved down there. Okay, good, excellent. Number two. Uh, page 34, uh, there's talking about uh, length of time for working, and you say there may be work time allowed after six, and the noise bylaws will also have to be waived. Obviously, this is going to be a problem, depending on how long you're going to allow the, the contractor to work and how much noise it's going to make, because there's people living along there and, and right behind that street. Agreed. Um, you know, it's a balancing act. We're talking daylight hours, Councillor. Um, um, so roughly, you know, in the, in, in the heat of the heat of, heat of the summer, that could be nine nine thirty. Uh, but pr pr appreciate the following as well. Some of the uh, work will have to be done overnight because we have restaurants in the downtown core, and we can't shut their water uh, off uh, in order for them to. Uh, no, they can't run a restaurant without water. So uh, generally when we work in commercial areas and there is water work to do or a, a wastewater main service to relocate, that's usually done overnight. Our noise bylaws allow us to do this work, to exempt uh, these types of services. It's regrettable, but at the end of the day, if we're trying to get this done as quickly as we can, these are the types of things we have to do on occasion. Please make a request that uh, this be scheduled as much as possible and the people notified because one of the things that people get extremely upset about is if they're not notified so they're not expecting it and they're kept up at night and because of whatever i agree with you 100 percent councillor lastly i heard you mention about uh was it lifetime costing you were talking about versus lease cost uh the, for for the contract I mean, when you, when you do a lease cost, you often get the cheapest thing, and then you, that's a capital cost for the town, but then you get a hit with the maintenance because everything breaks because they don't use very good equipment. So there's a, a lifetime costing you, comparison you can do. Well, Councillor, the best way to answer that question is, is we don't allow the contractor to install what what they desire to install. It's pre-spec'd in a, in a contract of this type. So we tell them the concrete is this, the thickness of the concrete is that, uh, the, the type of uh, baller, like it's all specified. So they ha he has to meet the specification. Um, so we have control over the material that's going in so that we're going to achieve the, uh, the longevity that we expect to get. 
So it's not, you know, whereas in an RFP or what I think you're referring to is where they can propose, we're in a design build situation, I think is what you're talking about. Is really exactly, they can it. substitute uh, yeah, what this, the, and uh, the cost. This is, this is not that. Okay. Okay. Just to make clear. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councillor Elder. Thank you very much. The uh, question is of uh, Mr. Cozy. Um, Dan, I heard you say that uh, you, you have a, the master contract, which will include Hydro, Bell, Kojiko, but gas is a, a separate an entity. Is that going to be a problem, or is that all going to be just smooth flowing also? Well, we don't anticipate it to be a problem. Uh, we, we met with gas. We, we thought we could convince them to be part of our contract, and um, we were advised that, that that can't be the case. But they've committed to working with us, and they've promised us that they will coordinate with us in a way that will not slow us down. So we're still working with them to, to resolve these issues, but they have to go with their own contractor, and they just can't be occupying the same space that the rest of our con contract is occupying. So again, that's my example. Maybe they'll be in block two while we're in block one, or they'll be in block three when we're in block one and two. So we'll have to separate it, but they'll have to move in and do that work uh, separately at the same time but not occupying the same geog ge geographical space. And I appreciate that. I'm just glad to hear that they're going to be working with us. Thank you. Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, I've actually met personally with their senior staff over this issue. They've given me their absolute assurance that they will fully cooperate along with their contractor, and I certainly have uh, Mr. Mark Emanuel on my speed dial should I need it. Any other questions from members of council? All right, I believe we have some delegations. Our first delegation is Charlene Pluman. Um, and uh, I've, I've notified, but Mr. Bruce Miller was hoping to join tonight and delegate on his own, and he can no longer attend. So, um, you know, there was a merchant mentioned, and I believe it's him. And so thank you. He, he says uh, he apologizes that that happened at the last minute. Appreciate the information. Um, okay, so thank you for having me here uh, tonight again. Uh, good to see you all again. It's like I just saw you. Um, I apologize for the document you have in front of you. Apparently, Xerox doesn't read my mind and has printed it in a wonky way, so you're going to be flipping all over the page, and I'm, I apologize for that. Um, and there, there is a presentation for the um, people in the audience, should they so choose, if it can be loaded. Uh, first and foremost, we just want to thank um, the staff and the council for the work that's been done to date. Uh, several cities launch into construction and don't even consider the word mitigation. So I think we're ahead of the curve for that and that um, we're appreciative. There's been a lot of work done by the staff already on this and the fact that they've involved us through every step is also something we're very appreciative of. So we just want to thank them for the work they've done so far and for even considering it to this point. And we look forward to continuing to work with them on it. The uh, in terms of, of success and the approach that we are really hoping continues is that there's multi-pronged solutions considered, that it's not just one solution, that it's many, and that the focus is bringing people downtown and into the businesses. So we really need to make sure that the businesses can get through this. Otherwise, we will have a beautiful but empty downtown. So um, that's our, our main focus when we're looking at which mitigation strategies are important, is let, let's look at ones that bring people in the businesses um, we also think it's important that there's sufficient dollars put towards any sort of mitigation project. So when we look that we're creating a downtown that, as mentioned this evening, is going to last us, you know, 50 plus years, let's, you know, support the investment that we're doing, which we understand is a big one, but with the right dollars to make the mitigation uh, successful. And we also encourage that there's continued consultation with the BIA throughout the entire process. Um, we're very keen to, to do that now, but also open to supporting the execution of the mitigation strategies as we carry through the process. We want to make sure that we're innovative in doing this. So when we're looking at construction, I mean, already we have a big 
sort of red or black cloud, red flag, black cloud, however you want to look at it, over our heads that says to people, shop elsewhere, dine elsewhere, get your hair done elsewhere, because there's construction here and it's going to be a pain. We need to get over that perception. Whether we make it easy or not, that's the perception they have. So we need to be innovative in getting them down so they say, hey, let's go down anyways, even though I think it's going to be inconvenient. And then they can figure out when they're there, it's actually not so inconvenient because we have these mitigation strategies. So we need to be innovative when we're thinking about it. We have to add conveniences and rewards that make up for the inconveniences that they're looking to face. Things like, you know, yes, as uh, Ms. St. George indicated, we are keen on free parking. We do think it would be helpful. We understand there's a cost associated to it, but we think it's a small cost to pay to make sure that this project is done successfully. When you look at places like King Street that Councillor O'Mara mentioned earlier, the loss of traffic through that area is impacting those businesses greatly. They've now implemented a two-hour free parking to try to say to people, come on back, we're making it easy for you. Um, and they have actually stated they don't know the cost of what it's going to be yet. They just know it's the right thing to do, so they've put it into place. And uh, it's, it's very new. We don't know the outcome, but they've recognized something needed to be done to get people back in the businesses because they were seeing a loss uh, in terms of the traffic change there. Um, I think if we're making free parking, I understand that you know we can't just let all of the parking enforcement go for an eight-month period and hire them all back. I get that. But when I'm saying let's be innovative, let's be innovative. What if we had them being ambassadors downtown, showing people how to get in, carrying parcels to cars, handing out free water? That type of you know, innovative approach would get PR like nobody's business. Every municipality and city in the area would be talking about you know, this initiative. And that type of PR is important for the town. So let's you know, be open-minded to things like that. Let's look at coupons mailed out to the patrons that are courtesy of the town. Thank you for coming and shopping downtown. Here's $10 off that can be used anywhere in the, in the downtown. Let's look at hoarding that informs people of what business is there, but that's also beautiful and interactive. You can have hoarding that has a lovely picture of the store and then also has some screen work or has maybe a chalkboard for people to write on. I say chalkboard because then you can erase it when it's not appropriate. Um, but so I think there's ways that we can be also innovative there to say, here's this great business. It's behind this sort of wall of construction. And also, let's have some fun with it while you're down here. Let's be flexible for unique events and not let red tape get in the way. So perhaps we can have a graffiti day where people come down and spray paint the street before it's tore up. It's going to be tore up anyways. Let's invite a graffiti artist who does a professional job of this so people want to come and see that the week leading up to it. That then gives us the opportunity to say to those people, these stores are still going to be open. Yes, it's going to be closed for construction, but these stores will still be open and here's how you're going to get in and here's where you're going to park. And by the way, grab a can, spray paint a little bit. Let's have some fun with this. And so let's not let red tape get in the way and let's not let budget get in the way of being innovative. Of course, I'd be remiss to not mention that the businesses are all still telling me tax relief is their number one. I, recommend, I recognize the statement in the report about uh, the Municipalities Act and Section 106, but maybe there's other ways. I actually had an innovative idea brought forward to me just today by one of the businesses saying, perhaps the town can take the BIA levy under its own wing and let us still do what we're doing to bring people down, but take that burden of the BIA levy off of the businesses. And I thought that is a unique way um, to think about things. So let's be innovative in our thoughts. In terms of, of funding, yes, it's going to cost some money. I realize I'm asking for some, some big things here, and it's going to be dollars. But we're doing a $10 million project to revitalize the downtown. And if we look at what would be you know, a few percents on the overall operating budget to do mitigation strategies correctly, I do think in the long run it would set us up for success. The cost to have vacancy rate downtown go up even more would hurt us more in the long run as a municipality. If you look at construction on uh, Rue Saint-Denis in Quebec, they saw vacancies go up to uh, as much as 50% as reported by CTV. Um, that's huge. We don't want 50% down here. We've seen businesses uh, both within our BIA who have locations that have other construction in the past and weathered it say that they were, they were lucky and they only had 45% losses during the time. We've had businesses come forward already to say they're anticipating those losses, and so they're shuttering their doors. They're not even going to try to weather out the storm. The similar losses are being quoted for Rue Saint-Denis. They're being quoted for uh, King Street, that they're in and around the 40 to 50 percent rate. And of course, investment appeal in downtown and the values of the properties there go way down if we have a vacant and void downtown. So let's avoid that by putting some money in front now for these mitigation measures that will have some successes. 
And then finally, as I mentioned, we're really appreciative that we've been involved in this process and we want to stay involved. We're keen to still be considered as we're finalizing these options and be involved in that. We're very appreciative of the work Mary Valley is doing and we welcome her and the team. Uh, we have talked to other municipalities and they've said one of the successes that they found was having really clear communication between contractors, the municipality, and the businesses. And I think that the addition of Mary was a smart one because I think that's going to close that loop and set us up in a good position. So we welcome her. And we look forward to supporting her how we can and how the opportunity to help shape the final results. I welcome any questions and myself and our businesses in particular thank you because there are faces behind these businesses that are wanting to stay there and they want to invest in downtown and be in downtown and they want this to be a success as well. So they thank you as well. Councillor O'Meara. Thank you again, uh, Charlene, for, for delegating here. Um, if we decide down the road to put some money behind one of the innovative ideas that you've brought forward, um, how, how do we ensure that that money just doesn't end up in the property owner's pockets and not passed on directly to the businesses that are operating there? I think there could be clauses put in place that, that there, it has to be transparent, that they have to show that that has happened. Um, you, we would very easily hear from the businesses that they're not getting the money in their pocket. So I think there's transparencies we can put in place to see that happen. And have you had conversations with landowners down there who are expressing a willingness to sort of flow through whatever they can to the businesses that are renting from them? Yes, not all of them, but uh, yes, we have spoken to some of them. We've not spoken to Bentall Kennedy, which is a large uh, stakeholder. However, 50% of their places are vacant, so they have nobody to flow through to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councillor Knoll. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I, I do feel for the merchants I went through my own business recently with uh, Spears Road being ripped up, and it was a challenge. So I do understand what your... Uh, um, what your residents uh, or what your uh, um, merchants are going to be going through. My question is for you, in terms of the BIA, have you uh, developed a, uh, your own mitigation strategy around marketing and such that, uh, that you intend to put in place, potentially more events, that sort of thing? You're very good at your events and they seem to draw a lot of attention. Is there some sort of plan within the BIA to, outside of our mitigation strategy at the town, to mitigate within your own membership and within your own marketing strategies? Uh, yes, great question. Thank you. And, and yes, we have. So. Uh, one of the strategies that we've put in place is we want to continue with as many events as possible to continue to draw people down. We may choose to take a hiatus from Songs of Summer. There's some logistical challenges running that type of event in construction, but also we need dollars to do other events that are more um, in particular to construction and tied specifically to construction. We also are looking at, within our beautification and marketing budgets, where we can cut them to focus specifically on marketing for the, initiative, for the construction period to get people down. So yeah, yes, we do have some strategies in place. We've been laying the groundwork right now to build up our um, digital strategy and our ability to reach people that way uh, has actually been growing leaps and bounds and showing some great success. And part of that buildup was to be prepared to be able to reach people easily and quickly. Um, it's one of the fastest way to reach people. So if something's going to change, if we have access changing, we want us to be able to reach people quickly. So we've spent the past two years building that up and want to use that you know channel as, as successfully as we can. We know that they're going to be um, you know, some beautification things that might have to take a pause. So things like Christmas lights or things that, you know, we can't hang flowers in the middle of a construction zone. So we're looking at putting some of those funding towards either beautification initiatives specific to construction. Um, as small as let's have a mat for everybody down the street to wipe their feet on as they come in. That sort of ties to a theme and, and then larger from there. So uh, yes, we certainly are looking at investing some dollars where, where we can. I noticed in the report you, were, you referred to, for example, um, um, other municipalities that have had, you know, vacancies of 50%, et cetera. So other municipalities have gone through this. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that our staff have spent time learning from other municipalities how to mitigate and how to actually exercise, uh, um, execute this kind of project. Have you taken similar steps in terms of talking to your peers across the country, or even for that matter, worldwide, um, to look at best practices in terms of how a BIA uh, can get in front of this kind of situation and individual merchants? Yep. Yeah, we, great question, and, and we have. We've spoken uh, at this point to um, primarily people within Ontario, but uh, we'd welcome expanding that. The, the reason we've kept it to Ontario is um, similar shopping patterns, similar weather you know, patterns, similar issues that are being faced. And, and we do see that the ability to make a big splash and draw people's attention 
is successful. So, you know, the, it's dollars, whether it's, um, you know, on one project or another, to have that money invested to make a big splash is important. Uh, the other theme that we heard continually, as I mentioned, was that constant communication back and forth. So um, I look forward to working with Mary on that because I think that is something we've heard time and time again is to, you know, have that important level. And then otherwise we've heard from all of them anyway that financially you can help them through this, that they're all going to take a hit. And, you know, what can they do to, to get people in their door um, is one of the other successful strategies that we've heard. Last question. Um, I know that the BIA is kind of an exclusive club because it's, your membership is the merchants or are the merchants downtown. Have you considered the possibility of working with other, um, um, I guess, interested organizations or businesses throughout the town to potentially partner during this period of time because they might be able to help bring some people down? I know that there's a, there's a soft spot amongst most Oakville residents and businesses for our downtown. I'm wondering if you've thought about trying to leverage the opportunity to talk to a, a Ford or a, a Siemens or one of those companies that might have an interest in participating in actually doing something in conjunction with you downtown, whether it's highlighting one of their products, something that's maybe even non-competitive with what you have already there to help draw people down. Yeah. Just once again, thinking outside the box in terms of uh, other opportunities that maybe you can uh, undertake to uh, facilitate for your merchants. It's a great idea. We haven't explored it yet, but it's a great idea and one I'm welcome to, to do. Um, we would certainly invite partnerships with outside organizations. Uh, I, I think you touched on very quickly there, you know, competition. We would have to think about that, but there's lots of great organizations that wouldn't, um, you know, create competition. And there's lots of ways, too, that competition can be healthy, too. So um, it's not something we're necessarily running from. We would just have to do it smartly. So we're definitely open to that type of a partnership. I think that if we look at this as a town-wide initiative instead of just a downtown initiative, I think you can really, or if you do, I think you can really expand uh, your, your fan base even more. Thank you. That's a great point. Thank you. Councillor Grant. Thank you. And, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I, I do see the laundry list of things that you consider to be innovative, and, and, uh, and, and I understand that your BIA always wants to reach out to new consumers. And I guess that brings me back to the simplistic idea of um, how many of your merchants, retail merchants, and non-food or non-restaurant-based services are open until nine o'clock at night when most people are back in the town? Um, I would uh, say that unfortunately not enough. So it is something that we are trying to encourage and work with them to stay open and, and try to get them to stay open. We're on the same page you are. We would love them to be. Um, and we get a lot of pushback. There's um, a stat that I just actually read today that indicates that 70% of shopping is done after seven. And I thought, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting stat. So we are gonna continue to educate the merchants that, you know what, this is something that is important. We, we monitor the social media pages that are out there that talk about Oakville and talk about downtown Oakville in particular. And besides parking, which is always the number one, um, ours comes in closely thereafter in terms of people's interests. So it is something we're gonna try to work with the merchants to make sure they realize it. We do hear and understand them that sometimes they're the only one there. And to do a 12-hour, 13-hour, 18-hour day is a difficult one, but we're going to try to work with them around that to say, okay, maybe it's these days you do those long days. Maybe, you know, how can we help you in this? So I agree with you. It's an area that we're hoping our merchants start to improve upon. Well, well certainly, if, if you want to meet consumers halfway, that's a good place to start. And I, uh, I, I appreciate you coming to us with this list, but I, I work a lot in, in poverty uh, and to them we say, it's always a hand up, not a hand out. If you show that you're working to improve yourself, then we'll give you a lift up. And I'm hoping that the BIA can see that being open to the times when consumers are actually out shopping might help them a bit more than just these innovations. I would, I would agree with you, and we will continue to hope to make them see that. Thank you. Councillor Elder. I thank you. Uh, my question was actually uh, raised by Councillor Grant. I, I'm very concerned that a lot of residents in Oakville, both both uh, both parents, have to work to keep things going. And I think they could ch uh, downtown Oakville could do an awful lot better if they had evening hours. So uh, uh, that was my question, yeah. and you have answered it. And I thank you. And I'm I, glad I, you're I, continuing to work with them to try to get the. Or, uh, the store hours uh, lengthen because it, it's a real problem. If you take a look what's pouring off the GOAT trains at 5, 6, 6.30 at night, like it's amazing. And these are these are hardworking people that would probably like to go downtown, but it's not there for them. Thank yeah, you. I would agree with you. I work downtown. I, I'm one of those families that both of us have to work. Um, and I work downtown, and I often can't make it in time to make the shops. So um, I, I think your points are very valid. Councillor Hutchins. 
Hi, Charlene. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I think we were talking at the BIA about doing some sort of, uh, have you considered some sort of like a treasure hunt or things like uh, free gifting or something like that. So you come down, you bring family, you look, you shop and depending on, you might be the one who gets it lucky and gets a, a prize of some yep. sort. That sort of thing to make it exciting to go back downtown. Yeah, I, I think it's a great idea. We're, it's not, uh, we're not opposed to it. We have several sort of different event or initiatives that we're looking to launch and that could be one of them. Councillor O'Meara. I'm happy to move the, uh, the report if there's no other questions for Charlene, and, uh, if the questions are done at the appropriate time. I appreciate that. Are there, thank you very much. Oh, we do have support, Councillor Noel. Sorry, one more thing, and I know uh, some of my colleagues know of my Disney obsession, so you'll probably giggle at this a little bit, but have you, when you're, when you're out there looking at mitigation measures, one of the things you should do is, is look at how Walt Disney Corporation mitigates uh, construction impacts, because they're very smart at the way they do it in their, um, in their uh, commercial areas, downtown Disney, uh, Disney Springs, even in the parks themselves. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of material available out there on the, on the internet, tons of it. Um, and they're very smart in the way they do that because obviously they, they've got a particularly invested interest because not only are they, they trying to increase traffic, but they also own the businesses all up and down the street. So right. look at some of those things as well. I would strongly suggest that. It's a good idea. I hadn't yeah. thought about it. Councillor Chisholm. <laughs> Might as well get in the conversation here. I think there's a lot of great ideas that come, come from, from the BIA, the town, and even councillors. I think you've got to do a great job Charlene and moving this forward in the mitigation and working as hard if we can support in any way let us know uh, we know we're available but this is going to be a real real exciting challenge but also it's going to have some hopefully all high but we're going to have some lows in this so let's get prepared right thank you I mean I, th I think hopefully we can if, if, if I may um, if we look at Lock Street and they had a challenge they had people come through and create you know mayhem down there and they rallied and they came back and, and I think they actually made a real positive of it and showed the community spirit. And so we're hoping, not that this is that same level of mayhem, but we're hoping with proper marketing we can, uh, as was indicated, get all of Oakville involved to rally. I think uh, several people, maybe not all, but several moved to Oakville because of downtown and hopefully we can pull on that and make them realize we need that rally right now and we need them to see us through this. And we need to be open to make them come and do that. Thank you very much. Appreciate your comments. Thank you so much, everybody. And again, our thanks to the work the town has done. Do we have anyone in the audience that would like to add to this? Looking towards the Chamber of Commerce executives over there. We're all good? All right. Thank you very much. We'll We'll confine it to table, and it's been moved by Councillor O'Mara. Mm -hmm. yeah. All in favor? And that's carried unanimously. Number three. Yeah. Item number three, some information on wayfinding in downtown Oakville. And that's you, Ms. Tizard, I understand. Yes. <clears throat> Just give me one moment. Well, thank you for having me the, this evening. Um, uh, Acting Mayor, members of council, um, bring you forward this evening an information report, and it's found on pages 43 to 58 on tonight's agenda. And it really, um, this information report outlines and describes the work that staff um, has undertaken to date um, on wayfinding, uh, specific for downtown Oakville, uh, starting with um, our research uh, to gain an, a, a greater understanding on the subject, um, providing some background on the initial conversations and consultations we've had to date, um, to provide some details on our findings as well as our next steps. So the report and presentation this evening really puts the initiative in context. Um, the first item this evening was uh, the streetscape um, implementation on Lakeshore Road, followed by the mitigation uh, activities. And really, the, the wayfinding bridges um, both of those initiatives. But I would like to um, just take a few moments to provide a bit of a 
a brief background on what is wayfinding. <clears throat> so wayfinding is a process of using spatial and, phys uh, and physical information or cues within the landscape to help us find our way around. Um, whether we're, we're, we're focused um, or facing a series of decisions um, as we try to make our way to a particular destination. And so the goal really is to provide necessary and anticipated information, having it in the right locations and when people might need it. Um, that is maybe at some of their, their key decision points. And those messages have to be clear, they have to be complete, consistent and predictable, as well as inclusive, so the information is accessible and really easy to understand. And so wayfinding, the audiences for wayfinding really are um, residents, employees, business patrons, visitors, and that's whether they arrive downtown um, on foot, by bicycle, by vehicle, or transit. <clears throat> so some of the objectives of a wayfinding system uh, include having a clear and consistent visual identity. Uh, that may reflect the character of the district. Um, it's easy, easily recognizable as a, as a key navigational tool within, uh, within the district. Um, it's an opportunity to reduce signage and message clutter. So really we're taking the opportunity to focus people's attention, combining as much information into maybe the, the one cohesive message um, as possible. Um, ensuring again that they're in the right locations. Um, so at those key decision points, and we want to ensure that there's space in and around some of these installations for people to gather and to read the information, whether they want to just capture that information at a glance or they want to take a more thorough look to get a better understanding of the area. And finally, these wayfinding elements um, must be integrated with other public realm elements. And again, that was the focus of bringing this forward as, as another layer of the, the streetscape improvements that we're doing downtown. Um, and so whether those, you know, it's, it's incorporating it with um, the streetscape furnishings, whether we have um, a, a future installation of gateway markers, public art, and really fitting in with the character of downtown. But it's important to note that wayfinding elements and systems are more than just signs. And so on the slide here this evening, we've got various um, other elements. Um, they're all, maybe with the exception of the technology, all local uh, downtown and Oakville examples. But really a comprehensive system incorporates landmark buildings, significant uh, natural features, markers or uh, meeting points, meeting posts. Um, it includes the streetscape furnishings, art installations, and even mobile technology. Uh, so that's the 2.0 we were talking about earlier. And so in these, um, on this slide, um, each of these elements, whether they are incorporated collectively as a system or looked at individually, uh, they become the commu communication tools that will facilitate movement, connect the places, so A to B, as well as to reinforce the, uh, the identity of downtown. So specific to this project, um, the town has already um, recognized wayfinding as an important navigational tool. And that's been identified through our policies in the Livable Oakville Plan, through various uh, transportation master plans and programs, as well as urban design direction. So it's definitely on our radar. Um, and we, we really, uh, I guess, perked up when we heard through some of the initial consultations during the downtown transportation and streetscape study, um, we need signage because we can't find parking or we can't find certain things downtown. So that was really the impetus or the, the, what, the, the genesis of, um, you know, of, of the initiative. And further thought, we anticipated that the project scope should be expanded to incorporate other key destinations or amenities within the downtown, um, and whether that's temporary or permanent messaging uh, and other navigational cues. Um, and so, again, we thought it was important to expand not only um, the messaging along the Lakeshore Road portion of the reconstruction project, but also to incorporate uh, wayfinding signage and wayfinding elements throughout the, throughout the entire downtown so that the message is complete, so you really are able to get from A to B. And again, this is an important mitigation measure, uh, providing that wayfinding, that navigation, that predictability um, of getting from A to B both during the construction as well as after. So again, that's that legacy that we can introduce through this, uh, the mitigation process. 
So some of the inputs, so the work to date, uh, we undertook research, we were looking at um, uh, existing wayfinding signs that we find in the downtown, and there's an example there on the slide. Um, so it's telling us that there's parking uh, to the right, there's parking up ahead, the, the museums are just turned the corner to the right, as well as uh, some wayfinding for the heritage or the harborfront trail system uh, along uh, the shoreline of Lake Ontario. So there's a lot of information um, that's just being delivered on that one signpost. So we took a look at the wayfinding signs, the official signs within the downtown, as well as private signage. And is, is there too much being communicated and how can we streamline or make it simpler? Um, we also look to identify various amenities and destinations within the downtown. So uh, places like the creek, uh, the lake, where some of the public and institutional places are located, whether they're in directly within the downtown district or just on the outskirts. Um, we did a variety of site visits and walkabouts, um, whether that was within the district itself to try to understand and assess the project area, as well as we've visited other communities. So whether those were within the greater GTA or, or farther afield uh, through our travels. You know, we we're always looking at um, sort of how do people navigate through different, um, uh, different communities. We did a best practice review. So we looked at the literature and the various studies associated with wayfinding, as well as reached out to our counterparts and other municipalities to understand some of the lessons learned as they were developing um, programs. Um, we are also involved with the smart city technology and looking for ways that we can support or incorporate some of those technologies into the wayfinding system. And as I mentioned earlier, how wayfinding can support the mitigation efforts. <clears throat> oh, I apologize, uh, part of my slide is missing. Um, so the other aspect um, was, is consultation or outreach. And maybe I'll just go back up. Um, one level, okay. Um, and so to date, um, we've, we've done the following, which I will list in a moment, but we will be continuing with these consultations and conversations as we move through the next phases of this project. So we started with some informal meetings and discussions with town staff and, and BIA staff. Um, we also uh, connected with some of the target audiences right there on the street, whether it was through some of the questions on the intercept surveys that are the downtown ambassadors were asking visitors and residents, as well as we had a booth um, at the farmer's market for a couple of uh, Saturdays. And it was a way for us to really start the conversation. That was sort of what the, the, the concept of, of wayfinding and the panels that we used are found in Appendix A of, of tonight's staff report. So we were trying to introduce and educate on the concept of wayfinding trying to um, communicate the benefits that it can offer the downtown district, um, the places that can be found and discovered through wayfinding signage or elements, um, and also getting some ideas about what would be appropriate for downtown Oakville. So looking for some of those made in Oakville solutions. Um, as well, we continued some of those discussions. Uh, we had a board and some panels at um, the Public Information Center back in December as part of the larger Streetscape project. So going forward, the project team will continue to undertake these consultations. We want to um, look for validation on the identified destinations, um, as well as to um, identify uh, and get validation on some of the sign types and, uh, and those locations that we've identified. So again, it's focusing on the signage system, the messaging that we're going to be communicating, the design, so the look and feel of those, the branding, um, so that you know you're within downtown uh, once you see these. Um, the technological enhancements, and as well, implementation. Okay, so I just wanted to provide an example of a wayfinding system. This is found on a, in Appendix C of the staff report, and it demonstrates um, consistency, branding, and recognition. So there's that similarity, that, that predictability that if I see something like that a couple of meters up ahead, I know it's going to be able to provide me with some information. And based on um, our walkabouts downtown and talking with other communities, we've been looking at sort of the, the context totem um, and the information to go pillars as probably the model for the primary um, um, information pillar that we would, uh, we would be uh, gravitating towards. And the third one, there are directional finger posts. So almost like a secondary um, information system that could be placed at secondary decision points. And also, in, um, uh, we're looking at some uh, old school ways. So it could be um, 
printed maps, um, as well as uh, some mobile apps that could provide some, uh, uh, some navigational information, and um, the streetscape uh, furnishings, such as um, the, the benches, the light standards, can all be part of that, um, uh, that, that system. So in terms of downtown, and this appendix is, this is Appendix B um, in the staff report, we focused on Lakeshore Road the, in terms of the reconstruction phases. So we're looking to distribute the pillars, so those would be those, those primary information posts um, through the districts um, at the decision points and where people can comfortably gather. So the first one, um, and these right now are, are approximate placeholders. Um, we will be working with the detailed streetscape design, um, observing and uh, working with the existing travel patterns and places to gather when, before we do a final decision on the, um, the installation location. So starting with the west, we are looking at the northwest corner of Lakeshore Road and Navy. Um, positioned in the open space that we have there, town property associated with uh, Centennial Square, and in front of the, um, the, the public library area. So again, these are just placeholders for now as we move forward to finalize. We're looking at a central location on the south side of Lakeshore Road, and to have that integrated into the streetscape redesign as well as the redesign for Town Square. And so that uh, would be a, a focal area as well as places for people to, to gather around and, and get information. And the third one, we're looking at um, east of Trafalgar Road on Lakeshore Road. And so it could be on the south side. There is uh, some space uh, there as part of the streetscape design. Um, or we may look to um, locate it on the north side um, of Lakeshore Road in close proximity to the pathway that, it, that leads out from the parking garage. So again, some of those key decision points. Uh, this is uh, an example from Appendix C, and it's just um, displaying some real-life examples. Um, so these are from various Canadian communities, as well as those um, in um, the UK and Ireland. Further to that, uh, some additional examples of some systems where, you, and as you can note, there's consistency there in the branding, the sizing, the information hierarchy, and um, differentiation on a theme as well as to address various um, audiences, so whether they're a cyclist or a pedestrian or a driver. So that's just one example of some, or three examples of some systems. I wanted to um, just get into a moment on some technology. So we're looking at ways we can incorporate technology. So whether it's integral to the element itself, um, by offering some additional amenities, and as was mentioned earlier, whether it's a, a beacon for Wi-Fi um, service, a phone charging station, et cetera, and those are the ones sort of from mid-screen, I don't know if I can get, so here to the left, um, and, um, or it could be using your own personal uh, device and accessing information or directions, um, or ways to interface with the information that's placed on the wayfinding signage. So there might be some information in the bottom uh, right-hand corner about public art within the area. Uh, and finally, in terms of examples, um, we can get into something that's in still signage, but can be a bit more whimsical or artistic. And um, these are examples of some customized uh, signage elements which really enhance the character of the district. So whether they're addressing the unique needs or constraints, um, whether they reinforce the local sense of place, um, they can provide an opportunity and incentives for people who are down in the district to explore and discover the downtown district. And finally tonight, uh, we're bringing forward this information report to be received. Um, and we're looking to get a green light um, for staff to proceed with the next steps. And some of those include, we want to confirm the final installation locations on Lakeshore Road, and that would be through coordination with the detailed streetscape um, design uh, work for Lakeshore Road. Um, and we also need to finalize and confirm the above and below grade requirements. So below grade from an infrastructure point of view, and above grade to ensure that we have clearance in and around so that people can gather and stop and, and whether they're charging their phone or getting information. Um, we want to continue the consultations and the conversations with the public as well as the stakeholders that we've met with and those yet to, uh, to come forward and, and have those conversations. We're eager to develop some temporary full-scale mock-ups and to be able to test their effectiveness in the field and, and well, or on the street. And we anticipate that occurring um, in, during the, some of the construction phases, so beta testing um, those, those elements. We're looking to investigate um, incorporating and supporting uh, smart city technologies. 
Uh, we're looking to finalize the design for the pillars and directional posts, as well as what other elements we may determine are necessary. We need to look at the timelines and the associated costs related to design, fabrication, installations, and maintenance, so looking at the full life cycle. Um, we want to also develop an implementation plan that not only for Lakeshore Road, but also to expand the wayfinding elements and signage throughout the downtown to complete the message so that anyone using the, the wayfinding messaging can get from A to B. Uh, and finally, we're looking to initiate programs in other districts, whether that's um, our other two BIAs uh, within our growth areas as they uh, start taking shape, and potentially to expand it townwide, to, uh, to a townwide strategy. That's all I have for this evening, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you very much. You have a couple customers so far. Councillor Hutchins. Thank you very much. It was very informative. Um, three sections on page uh, 55 where you were saying there were three major intersections where you're going to put the wayfinding on. Would those be the more likely to have the electronic the type of signs where people would punch in a, a store or something and it would show them the, the direction or, or those or you would just not have the standard signs for that? Our intent is to, um, to investigate digital format. So whether that's a touch screen or somehow uh, an interactive, um, depending on the, the timelines for the technology, we may um, at the outset uh, erect something that's more of a static uh, information, but the intention is to, to in integrate it into the, the smart city uh, initiatives that we're, look we're looking at for the rest of downtown. Yeah, I, I think one of your key things is going to reducing clutter is going to be very difficult given your uh, problems. I'd like to move this. Councillor Elgar. Thank you very much for the uh, presentation on way, wayfinding and appreciate where you're trying to go. But I, I'm concerned that maybe we're missing one fundamental thing. There is a large number of residents that live north of the QEW. And they all have vehicles, and I don't think very many really are using the bus to go downtown. And I, I don't see it happening in the next day or two either. But what I really think would help is if we had a, an app, and I think an awful lot of people have phones with apps, that would show them where there is parking in a parking lot and how many spaces are available if, in fact, they get in the car to go downtown. I think an awful lot of people know what's downtown, but they don't, it's not that easy to find a parking spot sometimes. And if we had, where it showed our, our parking lots, how full or how empty they were, I think it would help a lot because people, they'll just hop in the car and drive to a mall. And it may not be in Oakville where they go, but parking is a big thing. When you have a, even a young family, you want to make it easy. So I, I think if we could throw, some, throw something at that too on the, on the tech side, I think mm -hmm. it would really help out, drive the people from the north of the QEW down, downtown. And uh, I, I, the way I'm not against where you're going with the wayfinding, but I think the better wayfinding, we get them down there first, then then we'll deal with it. So anyway, I hope you take a look at that also in big big time. And if I can speak to that uh, for a moment, we are looking at um, a smart cities initiative, and so part of that is parking, whether it's using sensors to to indicate where uh, parking spaces might be located, syncing that up with with an app. That's something that we are looking at through that smart cities initiative. Um, and I'm assuming we'll be bringing a report back on that in the future. I'm seeing some nods. I'm hoping we can bring it back sooner rather than later so that it will drive the people downtown when we're in this re uh, period of time when the, you know, it's going to be more difficult for the shop owners. So if, we could, if there's anything that could be cranked up on that, I'd appreciate it. So I thank you. Thanks very much, and thanks for the presentation. Councillor Chisholm. Thank you. Uh, very good presentation. Uh, with respect to the, uh, getting back to the design and the concept and the, the branding and everything else, knowing uh, at this point in time, we do kind of have, um, and you can help me out with this one, with respect to our, our town facilities are all seem to be branded now with the, the appropriate signage. They all, there's, a, there's a look. And w I hope we're considering, because you've got that signage downtown in front of uh, the uh, theater, uh, theater Arts, uh, Oakville Arts Center, and then we also have the interpretive center for um, the trails downtown. Yes. So 
I know there's a lot of signage going on. If we're consideration when we're looking at this is that there, the color components of what we've accepted for our facilities might be something for consideration for the wayward signs as we move on. Um, one of the biggest criticisms always, we've had different signs and different, different uh, designs over the years and I'm, I'm quite pleased with our facilities and, and the consistent design that we have in our rec facilities and so forth, but is there something to just consider uh, for downtown, as in the whole town, I guess, with respect to that, to blend it in. Thank you. Councillor Grant. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I was actually gonna dovetail on uh, Councillor Elgar's idea. Um, I, I know with the Honk app, you can kind of see where parking is. Is there some way in the near future, perhaps, we could even start looking at how we can accommodate if there is parking available? No? Okay, I saw, I saw the lips. Just to sort of echo um, Christina's earlier comments, when, when we go out to market with the smart city technologies and the various hardware, we're looking at ways to, lack of a better word, advertise where the parking is. If, that's, if that means there's a sign in front of the, an electronic sign in front of the garage that says there's 62 spaces here that are available, if that says, if that's a sign strategically loaded, located somewhere in the downtown that says there's 46 parking spaces available in the, on the Church Street lots or there's X spaces available along Lakeshore Road, we're actually looking at this type of technology, but, but we have to see what type of hardware we need to support that technology. And I, you know, and there could be ways to link it to apps or linking it to, to honk. And, and uh, you know, that, 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 that is a, really the way to go. Um, fair, fair enough, and it doesn't have to be honk. I know and we use it, somebody from north of QW going down to dun, downtown all the time. It does get used, but I know when I go to Toronto as well, the Green P parking app, does tell you where there's a place, how much it's going to cost, and if there's available parking. So it is available, reusable. Councillor Adams. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the presentation. Would you mind going back a couple of slides? You had a picture of a, an electronic kind of interactive, that one there. Mm -hmm. um, and it was interesting that you showed it, and it made me think of at the en route uh, stops uh, along the 401 where they have interactive uh, stands like that to, I'll, I'll say it's like for entertaining the kids as you come and go. And I wondered if, uh, it's not really wayfinding, but it's more of a, um, an attractive feature and it might be the kind of thing that would match well in our downtown center in the square. And I'm not sure to what extent the BIA and the store operators would uh, welcome that kind of feature or thing and whether we've given thought to it. In terms of content um, or the information that these would display, primarily it would be a wayfinding information. So the map, how do I get from A to B? There's been some discussion, very early discussions about are there opportunities to promote um, individual businesses or blocks of businesses. Um, we haven't um, uh, gone as far as thinking about, you know, gaming or, you know, something that's, that might be not wayfinding related or not business driven. If, I, I'm not my, sure. My, my idea was more, uh, the thing that came to mind was, could you have a Oakville history uh, piece on a, a wayfinding um, system like that? That might also provide you with, for example, the list of stores that are in the downtown core area. The same way that if you go to a mall, you go to the uh, touch screen and you say, I want to go to a pharmacy or I want to go to a coffee shop. Mm -hmm. And it gives you the whole list and exactly where on the street you'd find it. That's the kind of thing I was imagining. Uh, certainly this technology would have that capability of, do, of doing that. Okay. So and that so whether it's public information, whether it's wayfinding, public information like the, uh, a bit of a brief on the, the history of downtown, uh, whether it's advertising, that's a, a balance I think we would have to... Um, consider. To, to consider and to take. Okay. Yes. So that's part of the consultation that you're going to be working on. That's great. That's correct, Thank yeah. you so much. Mm -hmm. Don't see any other questions. Madam Clerk, do we have any delegations? We have one delegation, Char Charlene Fleuman again. <laughs> Good to see you again, Ms. Fleuman. <laughs> I'm going to 
to touch anything this time, so I don't have to wipe it all down. Um, thank you for having me. It'll be brief. Uh, it's, it's a short one. We just applaud the efforts to date, and we um, thank them for keeping us involved. We'd like to stay involved. We really like to be a part of final design decisions and that type of thing. So um, I, I get the sense that's going to happen because of the involvement that I've been able to have to date. So I just, we think this is very, very important. We hear all the time that people are not able to quickly and easily navigate the downtown. It's extremely important. Um, to quickly address some of the comments that were raised, uh, we would also really welcome if there was a way to integrate, even in the parking lots during construction, a way to find parking spots. Um, like I know we have our pedestrian counter on the town square and it just simply notes whether someone passes it So I wonder whether there's something as simple as that if a car drives into a lot and one drives out It sort of can count it and even feed us the data and then go on our website on your phone and and find it So anyways, we're open to trying to work with you on ways to that because we think it would be important as well um, And we would also to answer Councillor Adams would the BIA be open to having something like that in the you know, town square? Yes we actually looked into it with a company to do it ourselves, and it was out of our budget realm at the time. Um, not saying we wouldn't consider uh, also contributing to the budget going forward, but um, at the time it was out of our budget, but we were very keen to have something interactive that people could flip through, that they could choose the screen they wanted to view, whether it was where to find parking, where to find a store, information on the, the area, what have you. And, and yeah, have that interactive display in the town square. I think there's ways to make it look like it fits in and isn't just this big, you know, beast. I think it would be an interesting. So we we certainly would welcome that type of a sort of touchscreen interactive um, type of display. And we also encourage and like to see that you're thinking to put something artistic in place for the wayfinding and and help it create placemaking. I think that's something that's important. We would encourage that there be a distinction within each district. So yes, there's an overall strategy to the the structure and the wayfinding but that each post within the downtown might look different than a post in Kerr Street, which might look different than a post in Bronte, because I think we all have our unique um, sort of traits and attributes that we all want to highlight. So I would hope there'd be a way to say yes, consistent, so that when people know where to look for information, there's some consistency, but there's also some uniqueness to you know, how it looks. So I think just to um, reiterate that we think it's in a great direction, we hope to continue to be involved. I think the suggestions that were brought forward are great, and we would uh, agree and support both of them. That's it. Thank you very much. I know how badly you're you're feeling, so thanks for spending the evening. With I just hope I don't get anyone else sick. Nobody wants this one. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other members of the public with anything to share with us? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not staring at you. You just the only one left here. <laughs> Uh, this has been moved by Councillor Hutchins uh, that the information report entitled Wayfinding Initiative for Downtown Oakville dated March 15th, 2018 be received and number two, that staff proceed with the next steps as outlined in the report dated March 15th, 2018 from the Engineering and Construction and Planning Service Departments. Discussion? All in favour? And that's carried. Councillor O'Meara. Uh, Mr. Chair, barring any objections from my council colleagues, as a last report is just an update report, I'd be happy to move this report. All right, I appreciate that. How, Council, how would you like to deal with that? Anyone have any questions? So, Councillor O'Meara, you're moving receipt. All right, moved by Councillor O'Meara that the Downtown Cultural Projects update report from the Commissioner of Community Services dated March 21st. 2018 be received. All in favor? Oh. Just wondered if you wanted to poll the audience. Oh, uh, Ms. Pluman, did you want to come up again? No, I'm not. You go four for four. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. All in favor? And that's carried. Thank you. That covers our items this evening. Looking for someone to allow us to rise and report to council. Councillor Elder, that this committee do rise and report. All in favor? And that is carried. We would now uh, 
The acting mayor arose and reported that the committee of the whole has met and made recommendations on discussion items number one, two, three, and four, as noted by the clerk. And who would like to move that one? Councillor Lischina. And seconded by Councillor Adams, that the report and recommendations of the committee of the whole be approved. All those in favor? And that is carried in consideration and reading of the bylaws moved by Councillor Noel and seconded by Councillor Grant that the following bylaws be passed 2018-061 a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of a meeting of council all those in favor and that is carried Oh, the clerk didn't see the hand, so for 2018-061, looking for a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of a meeting of council. And that is carried. So, no, I think we're good, and uh, the acting mayor has adjourned the meeting at 9.30. Thank you very much.